morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the February 28th, 2023 meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Present. McPherson? Here. And Chair Friend? Here, and I'm sorry I can't be with you right now. I'm in Sacramento. I'm gonna be doing a presentation to a joint assembly committee just after this board meeting on behavioral health uh, related funding issues. And so I appreciate uh, your willingness to let me do this remotely. We're gonna begin uh, with a moment of silence. Does any board member like to dedicate this moment? Of, would any board member like to dedicate this moment of silence? Supervisor Cummings, please. Yes, I'd like to dedicate this moment of silence to two individuals. I'm so sorry, Supervisor Cummings, your microphone, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'd uh, like to dedicate this moment of silence to two individuals. Um, Daniel Lamoth uh, passed on February 19, 2023. At the age of 38, uh, he was participating in a joint fire academy training in Ben Lomond uh, when he uh, became under some distress and ended up passing on the scene. Uh, Daniel wanted to be a firefighter so he could give back to his community. And so I'd like to um, mourn his passing and, and honor his passing during this moment of silence. Uh, the second person who I'd like to dedicate this moment of silence to uh, is Harry Mayo, who on February 13th, 2023, at the age of 99, uh, passed away. And I want to take a moment to just say a few words um, about Harry because he meant a lot to this community. Harry Mayo, the quote unquote mayor of Westcliff, caught his last wave on February 13th, 2023. He lived a glorious 99 years calling Santa Cruz, California, his home for 97 of them. Harry was born on November 26, 1923 in Pacific Grove, California, to Portuguese and French parents. His father worked as a manual laborer to support the family of six. The Salvation Army provided assistance to his family during the Great Depression, and Harry's lifelong support of the organization was recognized in 2017, and he was given a Lifetime Achievement Award. Harry became one of, the, one of Santa Cruz's first local surfers in 1936 at 13 years old, building his board in a shop class at Mission Hill Junior High School, and becoming one of the founders of the Santa Cruz Surfing Club. He graduated from Santa Cruz High in 1942 and joined the Coast Guard that same year, serving until 1945 as captain of the Port Detail stationed on the Santa Cruz Pier. After World War II, he worked in the local cannery and ice plant until he joined Santa Cruz Fire Department in 1949, where he worked for 30 years. During his tenure at the fire department, he served as a firefighter, deputy in the Firemen's Association, president of Local 1716, and Santa Cruz fire captain. After a short-lived marriage in 1948, Harry married Edith Marie Judy Parsons, a seamstress in 1936 until she passed in 2006. Harry was a gardener, RV tra traveler, dog lover, joke teller, and a loyal and kind friend. He delighted in the company of those he loved. Giving back was important for Harry. He was one of the founders of the Santa Cruz Surfing Museum in 1986, and the serving statue in 1992. Besides the Salvation Army Emergency Canteen, Harry volunteered for the Santa Cruz Surf Club Preservation Society, giving tours to the museum and serving as the club's photo archivist. Harry donated his extensive photo collection to Santa Cruz City and his surf history to UCSC Special Collections, which is available online as the Harry Mayo Surfing Photo Collection. Harry Mayo was survived by his brother, Chester Chet Mayo, his daughter, Linda Diane Tonery, Tor Ton sorry, grandchildren, Sherry Jacob Padilla, Alicia Jacob Ringo, Michael Jacob Michelle, and Heather Voss, as well as the folks up and down the up and down Westcliff, and the many surfers in the community who called Harry a friend. And so I'd like to um, uh, conclude my statement and, um, and we'll proceed. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings, for that beautiful tribute. I'd like to add um, a name as well. Actually, Supervisor McPherson, please. Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Supervisor Cummings for mentioning both Mr. Lamont and Mr. Harry Mayo, who was a good friend. And I have a photo of him with the surfing club. And those surfboards in those days were twice as big as or tall as they, the surfers themselves. Quite a little, lot of difference uh, in the years gone by. But uh, he was a tremendous person. And uh, I appreciate your mentioning him. Um, he was a great member of the Santa Cruz uh, community. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to mention uh, the passing of not a local resident, but somebody who had a significant local impact, and that is Tom Menser. Tom Menser had a senior had worked in a senior capacity for Congressman Sam <laughs> for the last decade, served in a senior capacity for Senator Diane Feinstein uh, with 
Many people in the community may not know Tom's name, but he had an outsized influence on our success at the federal level, ensuring uh, he was just such a strong advocate to ensure that we were able to get things at the federal level, including the Pajaro River Project. I think that uh, Tom Mentzer played an outsized role. Uh, but his personality, his humor, and just his friendship is something that will be missed by by many of us. And so even though he didn't live locally, he was just such a strong voice for Santa Cruz County. I want to make sure he's recognized. So if we could have a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Supervisor Kona, could you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, Ms. Coburn, are there any changes to today's agenda? Her friend, there are no changes this morning. Thank you. Are there any board members who would like to remove an item from the consent to the regular agenda? Um, I'd like to look at number 46. Is it just something you would like to discuss uh, that you want to actually pull to the regular agenda or is it something you just want to ask questions of during consent? I can maybe ask some questions, but I did want to add some additional information to it though. Not a problem, but we'll keep it on consent and you're welcome to do that. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Hernandez. All right, then we will move on now the, um, to the next item, which is public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors or to comment on the consent agenda, or if you're unable to stay, the uh, regular agenda. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us in board chambers? Please step forward. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Yeah, good morning. Welcome. It's uh, February 28th, 2023. You know, two minutes is never very much time to deliver a corporate shit sandwich. You know, unfortunately, now with what's happened in Ohio, um, the quality of bread, everything's going to be polluted with dioxins. Kind of challenging. Um, I do have some information here for the middle of the corporate shit sandwich, and it's actually just what it is. It's factual information. So if I were doing an ideal corporate shit sandwich, it'd be my, it's the bread that's really important. So I gave something to a street vendor about two weeks ago, and this is what she said. That stuff you gave me last week was amazing. It makes me feel so good. I need to buy some more from you. I want to keep taking it. I think it has the potential for anti-aging benefits and so many other benefits. I really love that stuff. It's amazing. <laughs> You know, I'm reminded the first time I was actually that I noticed I was hitting with hit with directed energy weapons, and that was actually in the uh, Santa Cruz City Council. I think Justin Cummins was there. Um, fortunately, I found something that helped me recover from what was going on, um, and it's actually what I kind of drink every day because we all should take care of our our health. That was a nice compliment from that street vendor who has a permit to sell some really delicious products. Sure. But as far as the inside, you guys are just following scripts. Here's a great article from 1982 about some of the scripts you guys are following. This is um, March 28th, 1998. This is something I shouldn't say because it'd be really rude, but it's appropriate. Um, and where's the one I'm looking for? So there's information that from 2013, men like um, Manu Koenig and Mr. Keeley, the current mayor of uh, Santa Cruz, have been just following agendas and scripts. And I wish I had more time to, de to develop it. I'd be happy to discuss all these topics, particularly with the Sheriff Jim Hart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. Anybody else in chambers, please feel free to step forward. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Gary Richard, Richard Arnold. I hope you're... <laughs> and fine toe there in Sacramento. 
Um, one of the people or some of the people that are never mentioned uh, when we commemorate that moment of silence are all these children that are being killed by fentanyl uh, and the cartels moving their power and politics into the state of California and uh, seven million people of which I, they were probably assassins and saboteurs if uh, Red China or anybody else wanted to uh, continue their, their problems. Uh, communism is not the communist or a group of people trying to overthrow the banking establishment. Communism is a tool of the banking establishment uh, in order to control, call, and uh, kill the people uh, such as uh, COVID-19 and also push for world government. You can find, I encourage the grand jury and independent reporters to look into connections uh, by our board of supervisors uh, and their influence uh, with such organizations as Civonomics, uh, green energy, private organizations in which uh, even uh, Carlos Palacios, who's usually sitting here, is going in and out of their offices, as I once saw, and conduits to both the United Nations and the World Bank, usually covered through ICLEI. Uh, on the front page of the uh, Good Times, which is an extension of In These Times, which is founded by communist James Weinstein, uh, pr you know, uh, praise civonomics. Uh, so far, they've cut 30% of people's time right here at the microphone. Today, they only had four copies of the agenda out there, and it includes members of uh, communist collaborator Leon Panetta's California Forward, which includes Bruce McPherson, uh, Fred Keeley, um, and the uh, list goes on. Don Lane, who gave the key to the city of Santa Cruz to communist uh, vice gentlemen. president. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Please feel free to step forward. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, and um, good morning to all of you. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your work up in Sacramento, Chairman Friend. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos. I'm here today to talk with your board, and I wish uh, CAO Palacio were here about the uh, decades of violation this county has committed of the Brown Act. This came to light in last week's Lookout Santa Cruz um, article by an investigative reporter, Christopher Neely. There is an item on our consent agenda here today that should be taken off, and that is item number 25, wherein um, Supervisor uh, Cummings has appointed himself as a nominee for the Coastal Commission. This should be addressed because it relates to the article wherein the C City Selection Committee that is required by state law, uh, Government Code 50270 to exist in counties with two or more cities, that those meetings be open to the public. They have never been. They have never been. And Mr. Neely's article brings to this, this to light, they've been meeting in restaurants. Now, locally and, and in recently, the, the selection committee chose Supervisor Zach Friend, Council from Capitola, Yvette Brooks, and Santa Cruz City Mayor Fred Keeley to be nominees for this county's representative on the California Coastal Commission. That has been called the most powerful body in the United States, and you know why. Now, why hasn't why were none of those meetings publicly noticed? There's not even information on the website. By Brown Act, it has to be redone. It was February 21st. That meeting was not noticed to the public either. So you've got to do something. You've got to hold your CAO accountable. Thank you, Ms. Supervisor. Thank you for stepping up to the representative county. And I think that the other, well, Thank you, Ms. Runner. He wanted nothing to do with the violations of the Brown Act. Not to hold the CAO accountable. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Back this afternoon. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that it was not pulled from the defense. Is there anybody else that would like to address us during public comment? Please feel free to step forward. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. <clears throat> I have a question in light of the um, uh, law breaking that's come out on the news. Um, November 3rd, 
2022, former supervisor Ryan Coonerty stated that if we saw teachers or police officers or security guards grabbing and violently removing kids like this, there would be serious consequences. I'm wondering why the Board of Supervisors, all of you who are seated here, have ignored all the letters and emails from myself and from other concerned community members regarding police brutality to children in this community. According to uh, City Clerk Julia Woods, none of the Santa Cruz City staff are bonded as they are required to be by California government law and by charter of the City of Santa Cruz. Um, I would really like to hear your explanations for why nothing has been done to hold the police officers who violently assaulted an innocent 13-year-old girl who was the victim of a violent crime who saw her mother being suffocated by her father and no consequences were handed down. I look forward to your explanation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Good morning, welcome. Good morning, my name is Denise Barr. I've lived in Santa Cruz for 40 years, 30 years on Pleasure Point. Um, I've been attacked by dogs twice. My issue is that I would like to see the uh, Santa Cruz Animal Control give out tickets. I would like to see posted warnings. Uh, you have laws 6.12.010, dogs at large prohibited, 612, leash requirements for dogs off premises. Um, somehow when I see people with dogs not on a leash, I make a comment like, can you put your dog on the leash? They, and they think it's a joke. They say things like, Oh, my dog's a good dog. Well, your dog's a good dog until he's not a good dog. And so a person that has to pay $100 a year to have my dog that's federally licensed, he's not neutered, I pay $100 a year to have my dog licensed while somebody else pays $26. Anyway, so you have all these dog parks that could all run around. But when I walk on East Cliff Drive and I have to be threatened every day by somebody that doesn't put their dog on a leash, and has mixed stupid comments like, oh, I don't have to. It's because nobody is doing their job. ASPCA, they like to collect the money, but why can't they just post some signs? You have laws, get them posted on East Cliff Drive, get them posted on West Cliff Drive, get them posted around Santa Cruz. Stop wasting my tax dollar for things that are not being done. That's all I have to say. I don't need to be a 72 year old woman walking in the streets that's threatened by other people that don't take it seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers I'd like to address us this morning? Good morning, welcome. Good morning, uh, Cove Britton, Matt's Britton Architects. Um, I did want to second uh, Ms. Uh, Steinbrenner's comments regarding um, the nomination. Um, I appreciate that Supervisor Cummings is, um, you know, nominated, but I believe that this type of nomination should be vetted to the public, and that some sort of explanation of why that nominee wants that position, what their beliefs are of the Coastal Act and the current Coastal Commission. So I would appreciate that being removed and having some discussion regarding that. Uh, also, I'm very concerned. And while this has happened in the county's uh, district three for years, um, it's also highly unusual. So the appointment of Andy Schifrin, which is Supervisor Cummings' direct employee and works in his office, appears to be a violation of Government Code 1099. Um, it's an incompatible office. Mr. Schifrin works directly for this supervisor. He's not a county employee. He is actually serves at will for that office. And by definition, those are incompatible offices. I suggest this item be removed and that county council contact the attorney general and verify whether that's allowable or not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Britton. Is there anybody else that would like to address us in chambers? I see no further speakers in chambers, Chair. Madam Clerk, is there anybody online that would like to address us? Yes, we do have a speaker, thank you. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, 
I want to address 5G technology, which is being installed all over this county. My understanding is there, it's part of the LED street lights emitting 5G. Uh, to quote from a DVD I saw just on called 5G Apocalypse, the Extinction Event, and supervisors received copies of this several years ago. Quote, it's important to understand what the 5G is doing and what they say it's doing. We're told on the IEEE beam forming document that this technology cooks your eyes like eggs in World War II. We all need to understand these are military weapons. These are assault frequencies. If you garner nothing more than that, that's what you need to know. It's microwave radiation warfare. That's what it is. And to quote a book called, um, uh oh, where did I put it? Here it is. Here's a section on 5G. This is by Dr. Thomas Callan in The Contagion Myth. A section on electricity and disease. A particular concern is the fact that some 5G transmitters broadcast at 60 gigahertz, a frequency that is absorbed by oxygen, causing the oxygen, oxygen molecule composed of two oxygen atoms to split apart, making it useless for respiration. And the illness has followed Thank you, Ms. by... Kirk. Madam Clerk, is there anybody else online that would like to address us? Yes. Mila, your microphone is now available. Yes, hello. And um, I am here uh, with the same problem that going on for 10 years is the same administration ignored every my complaint and um, I was exhausted by getting attention to the problem in mental health system and uh, it's still going on <coughs> the same way as it was with the previous administration and uh, it's very difficult for me to write. It takes a lot of time because English is my second language. It's easier for me to talk than to write. And uh, it's just uh, that ignorance, complete ignorance, like the administration act like they're blind and deaf. So like there are no leave people over there. So what is going on? The mental health department dominate here even more. Mila, we're having difficulty hearing you. Yeah. Why? but I'm talking loud. Do you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, so... Um, it's, uh... <coughs> Mila, we're having difficulties again. So do you, what the phone number to call? We can hear you now, Mila. It's possible that you were accidentally covering up the microphone um, with what you were doing, but we can hear you clearly now. So whatever you're doing now, just if you could continue it, that would be great. Well, I don't know, microphone uh, in the computer, so I don't touch microphone at all. And I'm waiting for, you know, action, for uh, action that needed. My need, my daughter needs rehabilitation, and now those two departments blocking rehabilitation for my daughter. 
I need to rehabilitate my daughter. I need help with that. I cannot live every day on daily basis with mental health crisis. Thank so you. Do something about it. Thank you, Mila. Madam Clerk, is there anybody else online that would like to address us? We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you. We'll bring it back to the board to consider consent. We'll begin with uh, Supervisor Hernandez. I know you had an item that you also wanted to discuss on consent, but I'll start with you for all of consent. Yes, uh, you, um, I, I had a, a comment on, on item number 49. You know, there's uh, bike and pedestrian safety improvements that are being done on Houlihan and 152 and you know i'm always happy when they're doing bike and pedestrian safety improvements especially in that area it's uh there's a lot of traffic that goes by there on the intersection and we have uh a number of schools that are there we have lakeview middle school that a lot of students walk to and st francis high school but a lot of students walk to watson high school in ansoldo elementary and there's a uh a good amount of neighborhoods from there that that are routes to school so it's really uh, important that we have those uh pedestrian improvements as well in that area but my comment was or my uh what i wanted to provide is additional direction on 46. uh you know for for me i think that this is a priority for district four um on item num number uh, 46, this widening road property uh, that provides open space and park space for our district. Um, our district has a lack of park space and even within the city limits, there's a lack of park space per capita in our district there. Um, and I wanted to provide additional direction to look at alternative ways to finance this project to get it um, accomplished, to get it done. Uh, so looking at, you know, creative ways, you know, whether it's bond financing, a lot of mid-county parks have been purchased uh, through bonds. And so looking at different ways, uh, in addition to grants, um, you know, other fundraising efforts, you know, I'm always glad. I'll be. I'm always glad that this project is uh, is that we do have uh, this this finance to or this uh, purchasing agreement to buy. Uh, but when it comes to fruition, I think that that's what I'm really looking forward to because when people talk about equity, you know, when we have this park space and open space uh, that we can have in in the fourth district, that's what real equity looks like. And so that's what I want to provide the additional direction to look at more alternative ways to finance this, this project in, you know, bonds or, you know, uh, grants. So that was my comments I wanted to add on 46. And but I will move the agenda, but the consent agenda as well. All right, Supervisor Hernandez, we will, uh, I know there's comments from other board members as well. Um, I appreciate hearing the additional direction on that item. And, and that seems like a very uh, fair and reasonable ask on, on that. Uh, Supervisor Cummings. Um, I'll just, I do wanna um, respond to some of the comments that came up uh, from the community about the um, item number 25, which is um, nomination of the Coastal Commission. Uh, so just so that people, so the members of, of the public know, we received um, a letter from Anthony Rendon on the assembly asking for nominations to the Coastal Commission by the Board of Supervisors, also the City Select Committee. Um, my uh, nomination today is coming to the board to ask for support from the board. Um, it's been publicly noticed. This is an opportunity for members of the public to comment, which we just had. Um, and the reason why I've um, decided to put my name forward, uh, I've been studying um, in the fields of biology, ecology, and environmental science um, since 2001. So I have over 20 years of experience working in the environmental sciences field. Um, I have a bachelor's in biology from Eastern Illinois University, a PhD from uh, UC Santa Cruz in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And I feel that it's really important as we're moving forward with the impacts that we're facing from climate change and the need to preserve our natural ecosystems, that we have somebody with a strong science background representing our community on the coastal commission um, as it's been mentioned the coastal commission does have a lot of power and authority and as we're continuing to develop in our community and as we're continuing to um, try to protect our natural resources it's important that we have a strong representative and so i've put my name forward for consideration by this board um, and so i'll just end with that um, on that topic 
and I want to thank members of the public for bringing that up and for asking the questions on that. So, um, the next item, um, item number 31, which is, uh, the mobile success fans. I want to just thank, um, the staff for bringing this item to the board. Um, these vans will help people who have children who are being detained to be able to visit them in Sonoma County. Um, my real hope is that we can continue to work together to help bring our kids who are currently being incarcerated closer to home so that um, there's less of a challenge for families to be able to visit um, their children who are being detained. Uh, but want to thank the staff for their work on that. Um, item number 32, the new life substance abuse beds will increase the number of beds uh, per day by three beds. And this is um, you know, a great step forward. And I really hope that we can continue to work to expand on the number of substance abuse beds that are available in our county. Uh, we obviously know that fentanyl and other um, substances have you know, made their way into our community and that there's a high need for more beds. And so I'm hoping that we continue to work towards expanding the number of substance abuse beds that we have in our county. Um, number 38, uh, that is the um, master plan for aging. And again, just really want to thank staff for their work on this. Um, we see a rapidly growing senior population uh, throughout the state and country. And I think it's really important that we are trying to make sure that we're going to protect our seniors as they're um, entering into their later years. And I also hope that as part of this, we can um, have discussions around um, the Live Oak uh, Senior Services Center, because we know that um, there's a potential that um, some of those services are going to be uh, displaced. And so if we can also work on trying to help uh, with finding a home for Meals on Wheels and some of the other services, I think that would be um, a good uh, thing for us to do as well. Um, and then just want to, uh, um, you know, support what um, uh, Supervisor Hernandez was mentioning around the South County Park. Um, if there's ways that we can find funding, whether it's, you know, publicly funded, privately funded, but ways that we can really try to make sure that we can secure that park, I think it would be a, a great way to expand open space in South County. And those are all my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair Friend. On item 25, approving the nomination of Supervisor Cummings to the California Coastal Commission. Um, I, I think Supervisor Cummings would make a great addition to the California Coastal Commission uh, and thank him for putting himself forward. Um, I think, you know, also just to clarify this process, um, my understanding is actually the more people we have nominated from our community, the better off we are, or more likely we are to get someone from Santa Cruz County uh, actually on the Coastal Commission. There's a fairly extensive process even just after the nominations and ultimately Speaker Rendon is going to, to make a decision. And so the more options we give him to select from, the better off we are. Um, and so in that spirit, um, and also just to make sure this process feels transparent and open to everyone, I'd also like to uh, add additional direction, um, putting my own name forward, um, self-nominating here. And I'd be happy to support anyone else here uh, on this board that also um, is interested in the position. You know, again, in transparency, the reason I'm interested in this is um, I've certainly in the first district, I have uh, dealt with a lot of issues uh, between the Coastal Commission and uh, oceanfront property owners. And we're seeing this issue continue to play out. In fact, even to some extent in the courts uh, in San Mateo County and Half Moon Bay recently, we saw um, actually the Superior Court rule against the Coastal Commission. Um, it's it's going to be interesting here, I think, as we see um, a lot of um, the, you know, this tension play out between it. Um, our values for public access and values of protecting private property rights. I don't think that there's a clear black and white answer to this, um, but I do think that I can help being an honest broker between these parties and um, ultimately trying to come up with some creative solutions that help our entire community move forward. So that's all on item 25. And then on item 24, um, approving the appointment for Andy Schiffer to the Planning Commission. I'm going to have to register a no vote on this. Um, I do think um, that Mr. Schiffer is a, a great person and very knowledgeable, certainly about planning issues. However, um, you know, we are also on the same agenda, nominating him to the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. He also is, uh, as was mentioned by a member of the public, uh, employed by Supervisor Cummings as an analyst. Uh, he's also an alternate on the Regional Transportation 
Transportation Commission um, for Supervisor Cummings. And I think that ultimately the spirit of these commissions is to have more information, more perspectives involved in county decision making. And I think we would really benefit, especially on the Planning Commission. I mean, we are facing an extreme housing crisis in this community. Look at item 33, the update on expansion of behavioral health services. We have been hamstrung in our ability to hire and expand crisis mental health services because of our housing market. And we can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And so I really, really think we need uh, someone who's directly involved in building uh, and housing on the planning commission. Um, I think that, as I said, uh, Mr. Schifrin has a lot of ways that he's able uh, to provide direct advice, including on, on housing um, to Supervisor Cummings. And I'm just gonna have to register a no vote and, and encourage uh, that we get someone with more direct experience on this commission. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you. Um, item number 25 has just gotten more complicated. Um, the um, I, I, I'm uh, very supportive of uh, nominating uh, uh, Supervisor Cummings for that. And now we just heard that Mr. Koenig, uh, Supervisor Koenig, is uh, interested in that as well. And in light of correspondence from uh, Council Member, um, Capitola Council Member Yvette Brooks, uh, requesting the board nominate her also to the Coastal Commission, I'd like to some, get some clarity, if I could, from the County Council of how we, we can nominate more than one, is my understanding. And, and in essence, because this came up today from Supervisor Coney, can we officially nominate him at this point? And Yvette Brooks has written us a letter that wasn't able to get on the agenda. So uh, we can, how many can, we can nominate more than one, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, all right, and for today, do we just stick with the one nomination of Supervisor Cummings, or can we also be nominating Supervisor Koenig at this time? A maker of a motion could add additional direction to add any number of Board of Supervisor members to the nomination, as well as any number of individuals from the City Selection Committee uh, pool. I know there's controversy on the Selection Committee process, but we do know that uh, Council Member Yvette Brooks has been uh, it says she is not uh, interested as well, and I do think it's it's good that we have so many people interested from our county. Uh, so I would uh, like to put her name in nomination if that's the proper procedure at this point. Uh, would that be proper? Yeah, it, it it when it comes time to approve the consent agenda a maker of a motion would approve the consent agenda with whatever additional direction on any items uh, that the board is considering, including that one, um, and and offer you know, the, the additional individuals that are being considered. Okay, I, I would like to then uh, introduce the nomination of Yvette Brooks, council member from Capitola. Um, and, and this is no, uh, this is not saying that, that our, our two, my two colleagues here are not worthy of that, but uh, it, she is interested and I think that would be, she is uh, capable as well. So I'd like to have her name included in the nomination process as well as Supervisor Cummings and Koenig. Um, then on uh, item number uh, 38, um, I'm a member of the AAA, the uh, area uh, agency on the aging. And I wanna thank the County Human Services uh, for taking a leadership role in developing the playbook for the state's master plan on aging. This has really come about in the recent years uh, in partnership with the uh, agency on aging uh, and the seniors council and senior advocates and stakeholders throughout the county. I really look forward to uh, working on this important plan to identify the services and policies that we can in, uh, put together to um, serve our age, aging population. And uh, Likewise, uh, for uh, reasons mentioned by Supervisor Koenig, I will vote no on uh, item 24 as well. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'll make some uh, brief comments on some of these items as well. I'm supportive of all of the names that were just mentioned on the Coastal Commission. I agree with Supervisor Koenig's assessment that uh, increasing the number of names from our region or from our county uh, can only help get somebody from our county on. Our, our voice has not been as strong uh, mm -hmm. in Santa Cruz County since we haven't had a direct Santa Cruz County rep in about a decade. 
And I think that it's it would be valuable for us to have somebody from um, from Santa Cruz County on the Coastal Commission. I'd like to echo comments that Supervisor Cummings made on item 32, which is uh, in regards to an increase in beds for substance use treatment. Uh, they can't, we can't underscore enough the importance of this in our community. Increasing the beds is a significant first step. And, and I just think it's something that it would be nice to be highlighted to the community broad, more broadly that, that this money is being spent that way and that we are expanding beds that way. Um, on item 40, uh, which is Willowbrook Park, I just appreciate again, this board has been very supportive of helping finance it. This is the acceptance of funds from the community. The community raised well over $200,000 uh, toward this project, which is both honoring Sergeant Gutzweiler, who was killed in the line of duty, and also reimagining this park for in his honor and his family's honor moving forward. It's it's the groundbreaking's already occurred. The work has already begun, and it's just going to be a, a remarkable testament uh, moving forward in that way. Um, I'd also like to mention on the item on the uh, master plan on aging that Supervisor McPherson and I had brought forward an item a few years ago uh, in regards to age-friendly communities, and in some respects, this is also an offshoot of that. Uh, as Supervisor Cummings and McPherson had noted, this is a very important component of of recognizing, in particular, in our community, we have an aging population and having a master plan around some of the needs and services that will be needed moving forward and how we're gonna fund those services as we move forward that way is very important. Um, I, I agree also with my colleagues on, on item 24. Um, I'll also like to register a no vote on item 24. I think that uh, what we're facing in Santa Cruz County is a crisis in housing and in transportation and in future planning that's of crisis proportions. And I think that it's very important to have a voice, uh, to have voices on the planning commission that'll lead us forward in that effort and not uh, move us in the past. So now it'll be appropriate uh, for a motion. Um, Supervisor Koenig, do you wanna try and articulate a motion on this perhaps, including the direction that Supervisor Hernandez had? Yes, I, I think I can do that. So I'll move the consent agenda with uh, additional um, uh, with additional uh, ac actions on item 25 to approve the nomination of myself uh, in a Supervisor Koenig, in addition to Supervisor Cummings and uh, Councilwoman Yvette Brooks from Capitola. And then on item, um, I believe it's 46, uh, with the additional direction to look at other options to secure uh, f financing uh, and monies to purchase the 188 Whiting Road property, including, I think, bonding and other grant opportunities. Is there a second? Okay. A second from Supervisor McPherson. A roll call vote, please. Supervisor Koenig? Uh, yes, with, uh, again, a no vote on item 24. Supervisor Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. Also registering the no vote as well that I believe Supervisor McPherson was registering as well. So that passes unanimously with uh, three no's on 24 and additional direction on 25 and 46. Okay, we'll move on to the regular agenda. The first item of the regular agenda is item seven, which is to consider a presentation of the 2022 Oral Health Access Report by Executive Director of Dientes Community Dental, Laura Marcus, as outlined in a memo that I put forward. I'll just like to briefly introduce this item because I have the honor of serving as a co-chair of the Oral Health Access Committee. And I have to say that the two people that are standing in front of you and the community right now have probably done more for oral health access than anybody has in Santa Cruz County history and ensuring that there's equity associated with this and also elevating the needs of oral health access in a way that it's, uh, can't be underscored enough. And there's been real successes in the last five years that I'm looking forward to having them uh, articulate. Uh, Ms. Marcus, please, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Supervisor Friend, and good morning, members of the Board of Supervisors. I am Laura Marcus, CEO of Deanthas Community Dental Care and founder of Oral Health Access Santa Cruz County. This coalition of health and social service providers, government, and education partners is focused on increasing access to dental care and improving the oral health 
of our community. Today, we especially want to commend Supervisor Zach Friend, who took a leadership role, and together with Dientha's Executive Vice President of Oper Operations, Dr. Seppi Tagvai, acts as co-chair of Oral Health Access's Steering Committee. Zach has been a steadfast supporter and advocate for improved oral health in our community, and we greatly appreciate it. Now we'd like to share an update on OHA's activities, results, and future plans. Okay, let's go over some history first. So in 2015, Dientes conducted the first ever oral health needs assessment in Santa Cruz County, and we actually also included Monterey County. And we had an oral health summit in 2016. When we went over the data, we presented it to the public, and we also introduced the new members of the Oral Health Access Steering Committee, co-chaired by myself and Supervisor Zach Friend. Since then, we've had a lot of activity and a lot of amazing results that we're going to be going over with you. Next slide. The first oral health access strategic plan included the following goals for 2020, increasing dental visits for children aged zero to three, maintaining dental visits and increasing the number of kids with a dental home for children aged four to six, and increasing the number of Santa Cruz County residents with access to quality dental care by expanding services and sites. None of this work would be possible alone. These are just some of the members of our OHA. And I have to say that having such an amazing group of different leaders with different expertise was so nice because they all brought their own expertise and experience and resources towards a common goal. I also want to mention the state of California who uh, funded our work with a $1 million grant in 2017 from Prop 56 funds and then $1, uh, $1 million in 2022, again, to continue our work. Oral health access activities have included launching a first tooth, first birthday education campaign with First Five and Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency to reach new parents and their health care providers, promoting kindergarten oral health screenings with the local schools and the County Office of Education, recruiting more mid-level providers and pediatric dentists at Dientes and Salud, and building new sites to increase capacity. Our dental providers trained medical staff how to apply fluoride varnish at well child visits, which is now reimbursable by the Alliance and as a standard of care. Lastly, we launched an oral health and pregnancy media campaign and prioritized seeing pregnant women during their first trimester at both Dientes and Salud. So we started this work in 2016 and by 2021 in those five years, we had some amazing results. None of it would be possible without our collaboration and our, uh, our partnership with everybody who was involved. Uh, before we go over the data that we presented in the 2021 report card, I do want to say that this information is only about Medi-Cal patients. It doesn't even include people who uh, are not insured or who are underinsured. So there has been a significant increase in access to care since 2014, with 25% more Medi-Cal patients visiting the dentist. That's 6,000 more people able to access dental care on an annual basis. Um. So as Laura was saying, it's considered best practice to bring your baby to the dentist when they have their first tooth or when they um, turn one because we want to focus on prevention and parent education. And because of the work that OHA has done, as you can see, the number of kids zero to two who were going to the dentist for a dental visit um, went up by 60%. So right now in our county, we have about a 57% utilization for Medi-Cal patients between zero to two. And that's amazing. And compared to statewide averages, it's really high too. More children going to the dentist by their first tooth, first birthday can have a ripple effect. The same is true for fluoride application at well baby and child visits. We're seeing fewer kindergartners entering school with cavities, and there's been a 79% increase in kids with a dental home. 
And the last piece of good news is that the number of adults who were visiting a dentist who had on who had Medi-Cal went up by 75%. And um, that's uh, mostly due to Dientes and Salud para la Gente growing their clinics, including uh, our clinic in Watsonville that was a partnership with the County of Santa Cruz accepting 1,300 new patients every year. Um, I just wanted to mention that sometimes all the problems in our world and in our county seem so big. And this is just something to celebrate this amazing data. And it just shows that if we work together and we collaborate and we partner, we can do great things. But now some hard news. As you can imagine, there's still a lot of unmet need and our Medi-Cal population locally is growing. Last year, our research partner, Barbara Avid and Associates conducted a new needs assessment, which looked at data from 2019. Um, this was due to the dramatic drop in services from COVID in 20 and 21. Otherwise, we would have looked at more recent information. Avid compared the new data to the original data from 2014. And although we've made some great progress, as was mentioned, especially with our youngest, most vulnerable kids, there are some populations that really need more attention. So as you can see on this chart, the percentage of kids on Medi-Cal who are going to the dentist is really peaking between the ages of six and nine um, to 68%. But as you see that big drop, when they get to the teen years, it's really dropping. So we definitely have a problem there. And then as you can see in um, adulthood, it stays really low around 20 or 21%. This drop in adults accessing care is shocking, especially if you consider the repercussions of poor oral health, which can have so many detrimental effects on your overall health and well being, including your ability to get and maintain a job and create a better life for yourself and your family. The 2022 needs assessment showed that only one in four Medi Cal adults accessed dental care. And this problem gets a lot worse as we get older. As you guys were mentioning, we have an aging population in Santa Cruz County. And unfortunately, 64% of seniors are known to have gum disease. Utilization rates for Medi-Cal seniors is really low at about 20%, but we're not even talking about those who have Medicare, but no dental benefits. In this country, we still exclude dental services uh, from Medicare, and that's a really big problem. Before we get to solutions and OHA's future plans, we wanted to share some important data on utilization of dental services. Oops, next slide, yeah. <laughs> on dental services by race and ethnicity. We're happy to say that we've considered equity in the work OHA has done over these years and successfully communicated bilingual and bicultural oral health information and education. In fact, 48% of Medi-Cal patients identifying as Hispanic and 30% of those identifying as other have utilized dental services as compared to only 25% of whites. So now for the future of OHA, um, OHA is going to continue to work on our current goals that we have, but we also want to expand. Um, as you saw, we have a big problem with teens not going to the dentist. So we're going to explore uh, expanding our outreach programs and our direct services to teenagers. Uh, we're going to be working with uh, our members of the OHA to work on diabetics and ac uh, increasing access for care for diabetic patients. And that's not all. Before we conclude, although it's been not been publicly announced, we are thrilled to share that just a few weeks ago, Dientes and our partner Salude learned we will be receiving a $5 million five-year grant to help us expand access to dental care for seniors in our community. This is a direct result of the collaborative work that OHA has been doing and the successes they've achieved over the past seven years. We'll be sharing more about our plans for seniors soon. Um, but now we'd just like to say thank you so much. We couldn't have achieved what we have without all of your support. And we welcome your questions. Thank you both for your amazing work and that presentation. I'd like to open it up to the board. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, uh, thank you for that presentation. And a, really a phenomenal success story. And what it does to give 
especially young young children, uh, self confidence, and just and the elderly population too. Uh, we've got to work on them a little more. Thank you very much. Uh, I do go to the dentist uh, annually, so, uh, <laughs> but uh, and then your success story uh, it builds upon success. That five million dollar five year grant and Miss Marcus, you've been at this for a long, long time, and I know your your associate there too as well. And I want to especially want to thank our board chairman uh, Zach Friend who has made this. Uh, top priority of his throughout his service on the board of supervisors um i'm glad that the county could participate and be part of it but uh most of all i want to thank you for it's giving the people a better feeling of themselves and we know that uh psychologically when they have better uh dental health care so thank you very much for what you're doing it's going to make a big difference in the lives of young people and old people as well thank you thank you Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair Friend. Well, first of all, I want to take the opportunity to congratulate you on the fabulous new space at 1500 Capitola Road in Live Oak and uh, invite my fellow board members. If you haven't seen that space, I highly encourage you to go check it out. It is a just beautiful clinic. Uh, I think anyone who goes uh, to the dentist there is going to you know, have really happy feelings associated with that experience. Um, and it's really great to hear about this $5 million grant you just got, particularly to expand services to the senior population. I mean, as was said earlier in the meeting, there is a bit of tension right now between senior services and student services in Live Oak, and the future of you know other sites, um, really in that immediate area on Capitola Road. And this really shows how we can provide services to all populations and be included um, so I'm just, I'm really glad to know that um, everyone will be getting service at that new center. I just had one question for you, which is, did you guys get those chairs opened at Emmeline? I, <laughs> Good question. We did not. We um, paused on that plan as we were working through COVID and opening Capitola Road, but we are partnering with the county at a new site um, in on Pioneer Street, which is close by to the Homeless Services and HPHP uh, facility over on what is that street Coral. Cool. Yes. Coral. Coral Street. Yeah. Okay. Good. So hear. that's, that's good for now, but later, hopefully. So you, you will eventually pursue the chairs so. at Emily. We do hope so. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Uh, Supervisor Cummings or Hernandez? Yeah, no, I just want to thank you all for the amazing work that you do to make dental care accessible to everyone in our community. Um, we know that, you know, we have one of the most expensive communities to live in in the United States. And so you know, the more opportunities we have to provide people with access to medical care, including dental care, is really critical to ensuring that we have a healthy population. And I'll just say I've, I've actually spoken with um, some folks who've utilized your services, and they were just praising how much better they felt they got care at your facilities than they did at some of the, you know, um, the more expensive uh, dental clinics here in town. So just hearing from them about how um, well they were treated and the, the quality of service they received, I just really want to compliment you all on your hard work. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. <clears throat> And I want to thank you guys for all the work you do in South County. You guys have the clinic there, of course. And, you you know, we do have a lot of young people in South County. We have one of the largest populations of young people there. And so thank you for all the work you do there. And I know there's probably a lot more work to do with the young, the teens. We have a lot of teens there. And, of course, uh, all the work that you guys do with uh, the underinsured uh, working people that we have there as well, the Latino community. And I look forward to, you know, the more services that are going to be rendered to the senior community. We have a senior uh, entire district that's a senior community there in Watsonville and, uh, you know, ever growing population of seniors in the in the city. And, you know, uh, beyond just the, the senior community in the in Bay Village. We actually uh, looked at some some uh, some GIS figures, and, and we found that District One and District Two, uh, the two Latino communities, has uh, overlays of large tracts of senior communities within those Latino communities, the two council districts that are pretty big, almost as big as you know Bay Village itself. So it's a big big population of senior community in Watsonville as well. So thank you for all the work you do. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. And I'll just briefly say how much I appreciate that you have been able to elevate, as I started by saying, uh, dental care as health care in our community. We, we generally speak 
there's a lot of coverage on healthcare and healthcare needs and healthcare access. There's much less on dental care. So I wanted to make sure that we, before we open this up to the community for comment, I did want to give you an opportunity because you covered a lot of information in a very short amount of time. What would be, if you're a community member watching at home or the local media that that uh, generously covers our meetings, what, what would you want as a key takeaway from today's presentation for them to be? What would be your key point or two that you want to ensure that we really do present? I think I would say that oral health matters. It affects your overall health. It affects your social, your self-confidence, your ability to get a job. So it's important and it's something that, you know, we should all care about and that you don't have to be a dentist to make a difference. Um, as evidenced by this work that we've been doing, anybody can make a difference. So if anybody out there in the community is interested in, you know, having some outreach services or having some education for their clients or for their family members, we're happy to help with that. I also wanted to add that I think um, the collaboration itself is what has made this effort so successful. It's utilizing organizations that have very different focuses like education or social services, utilizing their talents and their resources to include oral health in what they're already doing. And that's made a huge success, made this a huge success. The lastly is um, you can find out more information at OHAS, is it oralhealthscc.org? Um, and you can find the full needs assessment there as well as the report cards and soon the new strategic plan for the group. Thank you. Well, this is a non-action item, but we still uh, are going to open it up for the community for comment. Is there anybody in board chambers that would like to address us on this item? Thank you, Laura and Seppi. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I just had a few questions for you. I saw that you want to put fluoride varnish on children's teeth, and it seems to me that the use of fluoride is now antiquated because it is known to be highly toxic. And when it was being put in the water supply, we know that that was actually poisoning people. Anybody can read the MSDS, that's the material safety data sheets on exactly how toxic fluoride is. And that's why we now have products that do not contain fluoridated toothpaste. So I'm really curious on why you chose to still do that. Um, dental health obviously is a very good idea, but on these wellness visits, I'm a mother, I've had my children in the schools, and I still do want to make own, my own decisions for my children under the rights of my, for, protected by the 14th Amendment and Supreme, um, Supreme Court decisions. And I'm curious about these wellness checks. Are the schools going to be requiring parents to have them for their kids? If we don't do this, are there going to be consequences? And these are some issues that I am concerned about. As far as um, the assertions that you can't get a job if you don't have oral health, I'm not really sure how you come to that. Um, I pay out of pocket. Going to the dentist really doesn't cost that much money. And um, I think there is a lot of um, personal responsibility and on that matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. <laughs> um, the issue of the fluoride application really worries me too. As the previous speaker said, there's lots of data out there showing that that is not good for uh, brain health, especially in young people. So I would like to see that practice um, disbanded. Having a good, um, good, good teeth not only helps your um, your physical appearance, but also your but but also your nutrition. And that wasn't discussed. If you can't chew the food, you can't have proper nutrition for your body. And I'm reminded of that when I take a walk downtown Santa Cruz and see some of the homeless population that have very few teeth. I'd like to give them food, but I don't think they could chew it. So um, I would like to see some uh, outreach to the homeless and also to the veterans. Uh, are many who many are on the on the streets. So please uh, extend invitations and outreach to them. Now, regarding the issue of nutrition, rather than painting teeth kids' teeth with fluoride, why not teach them good nutrition? Teach them that eating candy and sugar and all of that stuff is not the thing to do, and teach them how to 
properly brush and floss their teeth. This could be done with uh, free public workshops in the in the clinics or um, in community centers and uh, make it a fun thing for kids to come and learn about proper nutrition and oral hygiene. I want to uh, really caution those in the 1600 Capitola Dantes that you need to make sure that you are aware of the toxic soil issues there. And if ever the power goes off, uh, make sure that you exit the building because there are volatile chemicals that hopefully the vapor intrusion. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers I'd like to address this on this non-action item? Good morning. Yeah, hi, this is James Ewing Whitman. I don't often get to thank many of you supervisors for things you say, but I am going to thank um, Zach Friend for asking, what did you say? Key takeaway, oral health matters. You, know, you don't have to be a dentist to make a difference. You know, I was taking a class in, at Foothill College in the 1980s, and there was a young lady there from Haiti, and she was describing a situation where the children were being fed Fanta orange drink as a baby formula. And these young people didn't develop baby teeth because they just rotted away from their diet. So there really is a lot of that people can learn about education. Now, there's a lot of different ways, you know, okay, to fluoride's benefit, I think in some ways it can be helpful. But I mean, I could go on for hours in ways that it's not. I mean, before 1936, its primary use was as rat poison, you know, because it's part of the process of, um, mineralizing aluminum and mineralizing uranium and they have to take it out of the, the fertilizers from petrochemicals because if they kept the fluoride in there it would kill the plants so it's my understanding that it takes 240,000 gallons to make one pound of fluoride safe so what did they do they put it in the water so there are a lot of things that the nazis learned from people who created Planned Parenthood, and that's how to docile the people. And you're ingesting fluoride is gonna change your physiology and you're not gonna be as intelligent. So the easiest way to control a population is to make them weaker. I will say that I do think there are many positive aspects to what I just heard about this, this dental stuff. Um, the fluoride's just not one of them. And so I'm glad that this process is happening in this county, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Um, Nicholas uh, Whitehead. Uh, at the risk of being redundant <laughs> on this fluoride issue, uh, as a chemical technician at the time in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, I had to work with uh, hydrogen fluoride, the hydrofluoric acid. And uh, it's true, whenever we wanted to get rid of something, we threw it in the vat of hydrofluoric acid and it just utterly consumed it. But of course, as, as when you work with chemistry, you learn that heavy, heavy dilutions make things safe. So I'm not against, categorically against any use of the chloride on uh, kids' teeth, but it, it should be very, very restricted to essential purposes and in serious dilution. Um, during the presentation by the excellent representatives of Dientes, I, uh, I noticed that there's a high proportion of seniors not getting dental treatment. Uh, I was wondering, could you answer a question about that? Um, do you have any reasons that that is particularly so? It, it occurred to me that it's possibly transportation. It's possibly that they're on medications or under medical treatment and don't have ready, uh, ready ability to get to uh, a dentist. Um, and I assume that the high number was not reflecting the COVID period. Am I right about that? It was a general. Um, if you'd like to volunteer any information further, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us on this item? We have no further speakers in chambers. Madam Clerk, is there anybody online that would like to address us? Yes. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Uh, 
Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and I want to thank the people who spoke during the comments here on the toxicity of fluoride that has no place in dental care. You know who promoted fluoride? Edward Bernays working, he wrote a book on propaganda, known as the father of propaganda. He's the one who, working with the tobacco industry, got women to smoke in the 1920s. And it, the fluoride comes from the phosphate fertilizer and uranium industry, totally toxic, has no place uh, in uh, dental work, we've been lied to like so many other things. Um, you said you in the presentation, we want to focus on prevention. And I want to recommend a source, westonaprice.org. This is Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts, Education, Research, Activism. They have a trifold on sugar, and this should be uh, basically artificial sugar is so damaging. And it's based on the work of a dentist who, at Weston A. Price in the 1920s and 30s, traveled to about 12 different cultures around the world looking at traditional diets and the lack of cavities and the, the teeth formation. And, of course, when white flour and white sugar came in, the dental cavities and deterioration. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk, is there anybody else online? We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you. That'll conclude the item. It's a non-action item. We appreciate the presentation and the community engagement on the presentation. Uh, we'll now move on to the next item of our regular agenda. Also noting that we do have a 1045 scheduled item. It's currently 1010, but this is item eight, which is to consider the general fund mid-year budget report with updated estimates for fiscal year 22-23 and an update on the 25-24 impacts to adopt a resolution accepting unanticipated general fund revenue in the amount of 4,500,000 from the property tax loss reserve fund, 860,000 from increased TOT, and 147,000 488 from prior year other revenue and providing for various appropriations, including 2 million in storm disaster response costs. Adopt a resolution canceling general fund revenue in the amount of 1.5 million from the cannabis business taxes and 1.15 million from the sales taxes. Prove the addition of a full-time uh, of 1.0 full-time code compliance investigator three for vacation rental enforcement and community development and infrastructure and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the board memo and the two resolutions here to present to us is our budget manager, Marcus Pimentel. Mr. Pimentel, welcome. Great button, there you go. Good morning, Chair Friend, uh, Marcus Pimentel, and thank you for that uh, well-detailed introduction. I'm Marcus Pimentel, your county budget manager. On behalf of the county administrative office, Carlos Palacios and Nicole Colburn, who is here today, thank you for giving me this opportunity to prevent to you, our board and our community, the overview of our 22-23 general fund budget and updated five-year financial outlook. We have four elements and then we'll finish with the concluding actions that Chair Friend already read out loud. Um, I'll ask that you hold your questions till the end and we can address them all at once. Uh, over the next 15 minutes or so, I'll provide a recap for our 22-23 fiscal year, uh, the development of next year's 23-24 budget cycle, and an updated financial outlook and concerns with um, impacts from climate change and local disasters, three disasters, three years, FEMA delays, those same storylines that you're all seeing are starting to really erode our, our confidence looking outward. As a recap to our community, I know this board is well-versed in this. As a county, we have dual roles like all counties. 
different than most counties though, we serve half of the population. So 131,000 lives in the unincorporated areas, greater than most counties across the strait, greater than our, all of our peers who are about half that size. So we provide municipal services to 131,000 population. We finance those municipal services and then we finance services to entire countywide population of 260,000. So that puts a lot of strain on our general fund and our funding capacity and resources. When we adopted our budget last June and approved the budget last June and adopted it in September, the general fund budget was at 712 million. While we have other funds and other operations and special districts and internal service funds, the general fund is where we'll spend most of our conversation. It's where we have a discretionary general fund revenue or tax base that um, is where we make our hard choices about how we allocate that to our primary services. The county has a history of strong financial stewardship We've adopted balanced budgets. We have a AAA bond rating and a AA plus bond rating for lease revenue bonds. We've reached our reserves at 10% level, and those are all great, phenomenal things. We have developed a long-term capital plan and not only developed our implementing elements of that plan. So these are all really strong financial stewardship amendment uh, accomplishments. Our challenges are well-versed uh, aging infrastructure. That's any district, any agency, any county, any city across the entire country. Um, we have out year gaps that are unique to us given our systematically unfunded status. And we are struggling, struggling, struggling with our FEMA reimbursements. And we thank this board for their leadership. We thank our congressional representatives, but we are still struggling mightily to get those funds flowing back to our county. From a general fund perspective, we are financed through many department fees, department revenues, clinic revenues. You heard a little bit about Dientes. We have a very large uh, health and human services divisions that receive federal and state funding. But when it comes down to it, we have a, a, a pot of money that our general fund receives that is that we allocate and have choices of where to allocate that to. Our general fund revenues or general fund purpose revenues are 181 million were in our adopted budget last year, the largest share of that is property tax. Our next largest element is vehicle license fees. Between those two, that's 120 million. Um, vehicle license fees and property taxes, we'll talk about in a little bit, are very stable revenue basis, and we're very happy that they're stable and growing dependably. Sales tax is a concern, $25 million base, but we're concerned about its outlook. And transit occupancy tax, while we're not as concerned, um, we think uh, an economic slowdown could have hurt some of the growth trends that we were we were hoping for when we looked in our out years. Um, within the general fund, there's about 22 million of other sources. That little, little pie chart there talks about that. Tobacco tax, cannabis tax, uh, state federal funding transfers in. That's kind of a combination of the major revenue sources in that other column. But that's a snapshot of our primary general fund revenues, 181.8 million. We use that to finance uh, 216 million. So you might, you might do quick math and see, well, you're financing 216 million with 181. You've got a gap there and we do. Um, we anticipate that gap. We, we allocate more authority to our departments and, and maximum budget authority, but we're expecting that departments will have salary savings, operational savings. And so that, that true spend level will be closer to the 181 from a general perspective. We've traditionally, and over the last several years, increased our contributions to our public safety and justice departments, most notably our public defender. Um, in the last year, we, we brought public defender in-house. That was a, a, an incredible commitment by this board and this community. And I think that the benefits were gonna be uh, well, well documented over the next decade, um, but that's that's come at a cost. One hundred four million dollars is allocated to our public safety departments, again, sheriff, public uh, probation, public defender, district attorney, health and human services combined get about forty million. So they're the next big allocation, and then the rest goes to our general government and certainly to our debt service that we have uh, obligations to and, and capital funds. Where we're at in our budget cycle, again, this is kind of repeating, so I'm speaking a little fast because I want to get to the, the meat and potatoes of the next show, of the next couple of slides. Where we're at in our budget cycle and the development of the 23-24 budget is at, today's February 28th, or we're presenting to you the mid-year. Um, we have received a department submission request for the 23-24 cycle per our directions to departments last November and December. Um, we'll be developing that, working with departments and proposing to this board by April 25th, a proposed 23-24 balanced general fund budget. We will be doing brand new, a presentation on May 9th. Typically the budget's been presented on consent. We'll be doing a more detailed presentation on May 9th to disclose and, and, and provide our community a chance to really understand what's in the budget. That will effectively allow us to really start having conversations much earlier in the process. We'll be following that up on May 30th and 31st with our budget hearings and including our budget hearings on June 13th. 
we then just from a process standpoint to work with aud um, the auditor controller does a fantastic job closing out the year, uh, reconciling all the budget actions, and then producing the final schedules that go to this board September 19th for adoption in compliance with the state of California's controller's office. So where our outlook is going, probably not a shocker to you, and I was gonna read something, but when we published our, our, our online budget last year, um, we, we took a shot at it projecting out where this year was going to be. And I'll read just a little snippet of it, just be uh, clear. Due to continued global supply chain issues, reduced inventories and sustained levels of consumer demands, recent price increases appear likely to remain. Higher prices will erode national and local consumer pur purchasing power, like pushing down discretionary spending that could lead to locally to reduce travel. That was our statement a year ago. And it, you know, unfortunately, much of that came through. We, when we developed that statement in March and published it in April, it, we were just at the beginning of the inflationary period. We thought it would last, and it has, unfortunately. Um, inflation has stayed persistent it, through January. The CPI and PPI, CPI is the consumer side, PPI is the producer manufacturing side, both saw increases of 6.1, 6.2, and 6%. So we, inflation is still here. It's still with us. Unfortunately, it's been very persistent. Mortgage and debt costs for consumers is rising. Uh, the average mortgage 30-year rate went from 3.2% now to well, of, well above 6% in just the last year. Uh, consumer confidence is dropping. Uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing stats where consumer confidence dropped by 8.5% in the last year and 17% from a year from the high about two years ago. Consumer confidence is a big deal because nearly over two thirds of our economy are driven by consumers. Uh, Sixty-eight percent of the gross domestic product is is driven by our consumers. So their spending ha patterns really trigger what's going on in the economy. And just it, it's it's remarkable to to think about this number. Personal savings rate has dropped from seventeen percent from a couple of years ago to three point three percent. Our national savings rate from seventeen percent to three point three percent. So when you think of all that piling up inflationary costs, it all makes sense. But when you hear that number, that's a huge, huge, huge change in our savings rate. That that will lead to consumers pulling back. Fortunately, the job market has stayed strong um, across our national and locally. We're seeing historic levels of great low unemployment, 3.4% nationally, 4.4% here locally. But our labor force is shrinking. We know that in our county, our population has decreased, our labor force is shrinking, and that's keeping the unemployment rate low. So while unemployment is great, losing population, losing labor force, not great. Um, the tech sector continues to lose jobs. You know, there's a news report every day about a company in the tech sector laying off jobs, shedding jobs. Fortunately, that really hasn't hit the rest of the job market, the job sector. But once it does, if it does, that will really be a huge impact. So I really feel that most of the signs of a recession are here, but the jobs are holding steady and they're keeping it together. Now, there's a lot of projections that jobs will stay strong, and I think that's true. Um, but I am concerned that we will enter, a, we will, we projected last year a mild economic slowdown. We're still holding to that projection that 23, 24 will be a mild slowdown. It'll creep into 24, 25, and then we'll start seeing recovery in a calendar 25. We think that's a more credible place to be. So sorry for the doom and gloom. Um, I like the years when I don't do this presentation, but I just want to disclose what we're seeing. From a revenue standpoint, I talked about our revenues and we have a very, um, while a large portion of our general fund revenues is property tax base, um, BLF back in the triple flip, uh, some of you were around back then, 2003, the governor switched uh, vehicle license fees from going directly to communities to now being tied to property tax growth. So property tax and VLF are, follow similar trend lines as property tax grows, VLF gets pulled up with it. As property tax drops, VLF gets pushed down. For our community, for our uh, um, Tax base, property tax will continue to grow. That's a great thing for the revenue base, bad for housing prices. Housing prices go up, assessed value goes up, more property tax revenue. That becomes a, a, a you know, two sides of a, a coin that's good, a good story for us locally as a tax generator, but a, a bad sign of our economy. Um, sales taxes we're concerned about. We're, we, we are seeing a drop this year below our projection. Sales tax has already decreased below our projections. This action today will reduce our sales tax projection by $1 million. We are projecting a negative growth rate 1% next year. I think that's credible. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but right now we have no other indicator of saying um, we're too too thin of a county not to, not to see the signs that are out there. We're still feeling strong and bullish with TOT. 
um, that it, it will continue to grow. Revenue per room, uh, occupancy per room will continue to grow. Voters approved a new ballot measure last year, and we're thankful to our voters for that. That will bring $2.3 million more into this revenue stream next year. The end result of that action has reduced our general fund deficit to $6.4 million. I wish it would have eliminated our deficit, but it did reduce our deficit projection. So we're now down to $6.4 million projection for the next fiscal year. Unfortunately, cannabis tax has taken a hit since 2020-21. Uh, we saw a high of 6.3 million, and we thought that was a good floor. Um, unfortunately, it dropped in half. So we're now we're projecting a floor of around two million a year. So not six, but two. So that's a four million dollar loss in cannabis tax. We hope we're wrong, but we we don't know where that floor is going to be. It, it it dropped really precipitously this last year. Um, and so we have nothing other than project that, that we're going to hover around a floor of $2 million a year in our combined cannabis business taxes. Again, while it's a small revenue stream, that $4 million loss is a big number. You know, that alone could have, if, if that $4 million would have held, if we didn't have the drop in sales tax, um, you know, we could have had a projected balance budget already at this point last year. It would have been phenomenal. What we're projecting next year, I have a, a peak to that number, 6.4 million. This might be a confusing chart. There are two set data sets there. The blue chart with the numbers are, are real, where we are projecting our current real deficit to be. Um, we think this year we'll finish balance with the actions that we're taking in this mid-year report to finance our storm response from the December, January storms. Um, but we are still projecting deficits in the out years. They've shrunken a little bit. Um, we've increased our model and increased, we believe, the accuracy of our model. We've gone out to 27, 28 with a general fund projection. Um, so we believe these, these estimates to be credible. They're, they include assumptions on salary savings, uh, uh, general budget savings, um, credible revenue growth, and they're still producing some small deficits for us to still struggle with. The bottom line number, the, um, the gray the gray box represents what we want to bring back to this board of consideration, kind of a multi-phased approach of modernizing our, our reserves. Um, we want to bring back some action by June that would convert our reserves from perhaps a revenue base to be the calculation based on our operating costs. So that's that's what we're trying to protect our ability to serve, not, not the revenue stream. Um, which should have a marginal difference, but it's just a, a better metric. And then work towards a longer goal of how might we get in five years, six years, seven years to a 15% reserve level. And I'll talk about the why as we get a little bit deeper into this presentation. Sure, I'll, I'll do that. I get excited about this stuff. Fortunately, it's recorded and you might be able to play that in slower speed, which would sound more, most normal to most people. Um, systematically underfunded. This is a storyline that we've been talking about for about a year. I don't want to stick on this way too long. I know you're all very familiar with this, but it just bears repeating. Um, our county is unique. We serve a greater population than most. And we have to, by doing that, we're providing municipal services to a greater population, which erodes our cost base. And we spread more revenue over more, more than most counties. On average, our property tax per resident is $463 per person. Our peers are nearly $1,500. Um, and I'm sorry, the state average is 1,500. Our peers are near 4,000. So our peers get 10 times more. And um, if we were only at the state average on our peers, if we were just at the state average you know, of all counties, that would be 128 million more our general fund would receive every year in property tax. That's a huge number. It, it would cure our deficits. It would fully fund our roads. It would have it go a long ways to bring our facilities up to code, not code, wrong word, but up to our standards and expectations about where they want to be. Um, it would be tremendous to just be at the, at the state average. Now, unfortunately, that's not our decision. That's state four decades of property uh, legislation. Um, so that's not an easy thing to change. It's just trying to explain why, why we continue to be so struggled with, with financing everything we want to do. The question we get a lot is where do our property taxes go? So this slide has a, a two a two for talks about sales tax and it talks about our property tax. Uh, for every resident in the unincorporated area, if they pay $100 in property tax or $100 in sales tax, where does that go? For sales tax, we get about 19 cents on the dollar, or in this case, $19 out of $100 in tax paid. And for general, for property tax, we get 14 cents or $14 um, for every $100 in, in property tax paid. The unique thing with, with online sales, we talked a little about the before decades of legislation that's driven property tax. Similarly enough, sales tax exploded with online sales in the last you know 15 years or so. But it's the allocation of sales to online sales tax is based on decades of legislation when trucks were delivering physical items 
that you'd buy from the manufacturer and it would be delivered to your county. That's not online sales. That was, you know, in the 1970s. And that's the same methodology how sales tax is allocated now. So the result is that online sales, the best case scenario, you are un uncorporate resident buying anything online, coming back to the county, we're getting about a third of that revenue of that sales tax. So our instead of getting 19 cents on the dollar from our brick and mortar purchases, when it's an online sale, we get five, five cents on the dollar, five dollars. And then there's a, a carve out that just happened a couple of years ago with the uh, state. They changed the rules and looked at the, the ownership rights of some of the warehouses. And now there's some where there are some online sales that we get zero. And so when you're on, when you're resident in Live Oak, when you're resident in the mountains, when you're resident in Coralitas, when they're buying something online, that sales tax might go directly to Lathrop or Manteca or wherever they're building the pop-up warehouses. And that's great for them. I'm not disparaging that, but the way our, our allocation methodology has been based on old, old models at the state, it really hampered us on sales tax as well. So online sales is great. It's really bolstered the economy, but it's created unfair disadvantages on where the money flows. Now, getting back to reserves or why we want to propose some modernization of our reserves is currently we're at 10%, which is fantastic. That's, that's a good number. We've been historically at seven. We've we set a goal to get it to 10. Uh, at the city level, you might find cities in the 18 to 20% range. Um, but for us, getting to 10 was a, was a big step, and I applaud the efforts. When we look into our reserves, um, 6% of that 10% is, is based on our friends on health, health services department reserves that they have, funding that they receive for service delivery, for expansion, for investment in supporting healthcare, mental health operations. Because of our reserve set at 10%, we're unable and we're restricting a lot of those health reserves from being allocated in the way that other counties can. So that puts us a lock on, on those reserves. And if we were to back those out, those health reserves, we dropped a 4% reserve level, which is less than two payroll cycles. So that's just not a place we, we can go to. So what it ends up doing is it ends up us having really tough conversations with uh, our health and services who want to do more. And there's a lot of demand out there, but but some of our investment capital is locked up because we have to meet our general fund. And we need to have some reserves in place if we found out with three disasters in three years and the delays that it takes for FEMA. We just cannot accommodate a reserve any lower than 10%. So what we would like to do is convert it and then find a target breach place where we try to get to 15% with still a floor of 10% where we have that flexibility where if there's a, a great project that health wants to do, we can tap into that without jeopardizing our 10% reserve policy, but we've built up our general fund number from 4% to 6% to 8% to 10% so that we have that flexibility. Um, we still are a cash strapped county. We'll continue to be um, probably until the early 2030s when there's some other things that we can talk about on a, a more deeper budget study time. But um, that's some of the, ju the justification for reserves. And, you know, again, not to sensationalize it, three events, three years, you, you know the story very well. We've just had went through another recent this weekend um, weather created event that we, we had to react to. Um, that's resulted in 67.7 million still stuck with FEMA. Fortunately, FEMA is obligated about 500,000 this year. With that set number, they owe 67.7 million. They've obligated 500,000. Um, we are expecting and built into this year's forecast that we'll have 5 million. So we'll receive another 4.5 million by June 30. We think that's credible given all the congressional pressure, uh, our, our weekly and biweekly meetings we're having with different FEMA staff. So we think we, we're generating the pressure, but $67.7 million locked up. 18% um, of our claims have only been paid over, you know, multiple, multiple years, we're approaching 26 million stale claims, two years old. That's, that's, that's become an issue for us. It's become a challenge with more storm events, with more disasters likely. We really need to have some flexibility with our storm uh, frequency. So I'll finish with our actions this year are to consider and receive this report, accept unanticipated revenue, uh, appropriate $2 million for our recent storm response December, January, not this weekend's, but the December, January response, reduced in certain revenues. We talked about cannabis tax and sales tax. And per the board's direction that uh, I think culminated on uh, December 13th, um, adding vacation rental enforcement to the staff and, and operations costs for our vacation rental. So that's what, is included in the recommendation. I'm, this concludes my presentation and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Pimentel. Always a wonderful presentation and extremely informative. Uh, bring it back to the board for questions. Are there any members that would like to ask a question? 
Um, Mr. Chair, um, I, I just want to thank you, Mr. Ben Patel, for that uh, report that lays out what uh, many of us have been saying and anticipating. It's going to be a really tough budget year, uh, facing a $6.4 million deficit to begin with. There's a lot of other numbers to be concerned about as well. And while we're seeing some encouraging growth in some of our revenue streams, uh, we're also looking at some sizable uh, general fund def deficits in the next few years um, that will hold. It's going to require some increased uh, revenue. We're holding the line on expenses and to close the gaps. And so that's going to be a tough decision we're going to have to make. And what really concerns me is the serious lack of clarity about reimbursement by the federal government mm -hmm. that we're facing and for disaster expenses. And as you mentioned, we've had, we've had enough of those for a long, long time. Thank you. Three and three years. Um, and the amount of unpaid reimbursements by fee, uh, FEMA from COVID and uh, the CZU fire are at $67 million. It's just incomprehensible. How do we fill that gap? And yet we haven't figured out yet um, the reimbursements uh, that will be needed to cover the uh, atmospheric river event. And what kind of uncertainty, um, well, with that kind of uncertainty, what can we how do we account for these reimbursements in future budgets? Uh, I mean, it's a crystal ball. I don't know how you do it, but uh, it's here and it's upon us and uh, it looks like it's going to get worse. No, I, I think that's probably the greatest and hardest projection right now for any budget person facing that number. You know, projecting a revenue stream that has some history, you can, you can understand the trends and the impacts of it. Understanding staff be and FEMA land of their decisions from a bureaucratic policy, cash flow management, it's, you know, all that's opaque. We don't, we don't understand the methodology behind it. So Supervisor McPherson, that, that's a phenomenal question. It is the question we're struggling with. We're projecting again, 5 million that we'll receive this year. We we're anticipating that from a cash flow perspective, we're anticipating each in the next two years between 16 and 19 million. Um, we, we really believe that by that three year, four year mark, they have to start performing and that's, typically been the worst case scenarios for reimbursement of costs we've already incurred. Different from like this last storm damage that we might be facing $40 million of infrastructure or other damage that will take years to work on engineers and environmental studies and everything else right. it takes to repair those infrastructure items. Just our response costs, it, it's hard to predict that. And that's a phenomenal question and one we're, we're gonna continue to struggle with. Okay, thank you. I understand you can't give a definitive answer on that, but uh, what, and what, there's a lot of numbers that you mentioned, but the, the decrease in savings from people uh, from yeah. 17 to 3%, I mean, that's kind of reflective of what we're facing too. We just don't have the reserve fund that we, we want and should have. And thank heavens we've had that and we built it up to 10% uh, in recent years, but um, through no fault of our own, uh, there's, it's gone. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much yeah. for that presentation. And, and you, I, I felt you, you talked about revenue streams. We, we still have some flexibility with our sales tax base where we are on the lower end of sales tax. While though at 9%, there are many jurisdictions at nine and a quarter, nine and a half. So we have some flexibility there, but. Right. Be I, I know that there's going to be some discussion on a tax measure possibly next year as well. And uh, people say, how can you do that to us? Increase our taxes of the sales tax or whatever. Uh, but um if we want to provide the services we do to the uh, half of Santa Cruz County that's uh, in the unincorporated area and, and throughout Santa Cruz County, we're going to have to take some real serious and not really pleasant actions, I think, in this year in our budget sessions. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Any other board members with questions? Supervisor Koenig? Thank you, Chair. First of all, Budget Manager Pimentel, thank you for the report. Yeah, it's a particularly sobering one here. Um, I know uh, this is a lot of themes that we've seen now for uh, at least a couple of years I've been on the board. Um, and it's it's always a shock going from, you know, all the things that you campaign on and ways that you want to improve the community and then running into this stark financial picture here where we're really uh, getting the short end of the stick, particularly with a lot of the apportionment formulas coming down from the state level. Um, you know, I guess I would certainly thank voters for passing the increase in the transient occupancy tax. And I also thank staff for the recommendation of adding a position to code compliance um, for vacation rentals. You know, it's difficult with all of the needs that we have in our uh, community to, to be spending uh, money on enforcement. I, I'm sure if you, if you don't deal with this issue every day, the way I know I do and, and Supervisor Chair Friend does, um, 
But at the same time, transient occupancy taxes have been one of the bright spots. And of course, they have a very significant, the, these um, short-term rentals do have a very significant impact on the neighborhoods where, where they are. Um, and so I think that we really owe it to the community to ensure that we're being essentially, you know, responsibly helping to manage this business that is taking place in, in residential neighborhoods. And so, um, you know, I get asked about changes that we could make to the short-term rental ordinance all the time. But I think the, the most important first step is ensuring that the ordinance that we have is is properly enforced. Um, so, you know, I, I again, appreciate this recommendation. I'll support it. Um, the other question I have is, you know, again, kind of getting back to these the, the state apportionment. I mean, I appreciate the slide on sales taxes, right? I knew that uh, I thought that we were doing better with online sales, but to see that we're doing that much worse is pretty concerning. Given that, um, I, you know, I think this is probably a trend that will only continue as people continuing to shop online is just so dang convenient. And as much as I know, I want to support local business I, businesses. I feel like nine times out of ten, I go into a store to get something, and unfortunately, it's not in stock. And I find myself again shopping online despite uh the my best intentions um i mean should this is a question maybe as much for supervisor mcpherson who i know uh, is a representative at csac I mean, is there any discussion at the state level about changing this apportionment uh, particularly for sales tax or is it something that our board could advocate for further i mean I'd be prepared to to move that we you know write a letter to our state legislators, which you know we, we picked up one. We have a little bit more representation for Santa Cruz County this year. It seems like it, you know we really need to highlight this problem um, and ask them to address it because otherwise we're in big trouble. I can just say generally that this is a concern for a lot of people, uh, counties throughout of our 58 counties throughout the state. Probably the most significant ones is the property tax revenue, where we are and we're set. And to change that is going to take a statewide saying, okay, Santa Cruz County, we'll give you more, but we'll take less. And it's just not going to happen. But the, the point is, how can what can we do? I mean, there's a limit on the sales tax and so forth. Uh, we could present that if we wanted. Um, that'd be a good discussion to have. That, that's I mean, we yeah. Uh, there's a limit to the sales tax, and we're at nine percent. And they think you can get a cap at nine uh, three quarters. Uh, yeah, nine three quarters. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking even just at the way that the sales tax. I think this is the, the state sales tax that is collected. How that then comes back to you know us at the county and and other local agencies. I mean, I think we can pretty fairly make the argument that if we're being asked to add four thousand six hundred and thirty four units within the county over the next eight years, we can't continue to main, maintain services for our existing population and add resident that many residents if we don't have at least the same amount of percentage of, of our sales tax that we have historically. If we're if we're being asked to take less, then you know our this system will crumble. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. I think that those are good points. And, and uh, maybe when it comes time for a motion, Supervisor McPherson, this could be considered at CSAC by the board as far as an item. And also uh, it could be maybe added to our ledge program or legislative advocacy program that the, that the board produces. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, I believe you had a question. actually have an additional question with some of Manu's comments. Do cities have the same apportionment for this for their online sales tax as well as counties? Yeah, it it, de it depends on their tax sales tax base of brick and mortar. So a city like Capitola is a small population, but you know, shrinking mall but still a heavy tax base, they'll get more of the allocation. So it's really based on your brick and mortar size proportionally because we don't have a lot of brick and mortar retail sales in our county a lot of our counties undeveloped land we're, we're, we're punished by that i think we should tag team with csac and you know league of cities probably as well i'm sure they would be on board with that as well my, my question was um you know it was pretty daunting to see the the decrease in sales tax with the cannabis so from six million to two million uh what it, what what contributed to that? Was it the uh, decrease in sales or loss in business licenses or no, what happened I, in that? Because I, I, I think in South County, we still have, there's still vying for licenses over there. I don't know what's going on over there. I think we're really seeing in consumer preference and maybe they're just finding other options outside of retail commercial. Oh, we have to look at something, you yeah. know, to make yeah. sure we preserve. 
what we have. Thank you, Supervisor Renez. Uh, Supervisor Cummings, did you have anything? I think all my questions. Thank I think all my questions were answered um, during the presentation. I do have some comments after we hear from the public, though. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, I, I'm in agreement with uh, Supervisor Koenig's uh, question slash additional direction that'll be coming forward. I did have one brief question, uh, Mr. Pimentel, which is that in here it includes about $150,000 for uh, communities or neighborhoods that are impacted by vacation rentals. This is something that Supervisor Koenig and I had asked for in addition to also the code compliance inspector, and we appreciate that is being done. It doesn't really explain uh, how or that will be uh, allocated or or what it'll be allocated for. Is there going to be an additional item coming back to the board to discuss that or or do, do you already have a sense of what the staff's construct for that would be? That's a great question, Supervisor Friend, Chair Friend. Um, we were developing that in, in, in tune with our Bose 23-24 budget. There's another item that we're looking for some environmental funded programs as well. So we've got two initiatives that will be presented as part of the 23-24 uh, vacation rental and environmental response. Perfect. You may recollect, um, you know, Supervisor Koenig and I had added additional direction at the some time back when we had the update on the vacation rentals, and we provided some construct of a of a starting point for how those funds could be spent on parks or some other beautification projects. Some, some ideas in that that idea, but uh, so we look forward. What I'm hearing is that I, I believe that this will be coming forward as part of the the broader budget, and then we'll have an opportunity to discuss the allocation at that time. Is that correct? Yeah, and it'll be I expect in line with the direction we received. Perfect. All right, we'll now open it up for the community. Is there any member of the community and chambers that would like to address us on this item? Good morning. Welcome back. Yeah, good morning still. Uh, yeah, I was around last year for the four days of the $1.3 billion budget hearings. That was fascinating. Uh, I'm not, it's just great to observe here. I, I think I haven't pissed all of you off yet this morning. You just weren't listening. Um, so I don't know if I want to continue to do that. Uh, it really seems like um, you guys are surprised that the country is struggling and this county is struggling. You know, here's some information from 1998 written in the Aptos Times, March 15th, uh, about Agenda 21 pros and cons. And now there's a process called the Delphi technique for facilitators. I'm going to read this. Our objective is to get the answers we want and make the citizens think they are participating in the public process while all the decisions have already been made beforehand. So I'm obviously here, and I'm not making money. I actually care about my community, and I actually care about you guys too. So uh, I don't know. I'd probably be seen as a jerk to say some of the things that I wrote down, but I was paying attention to this budget hearing, and I really wonder what's going to happen when there's a real serious problem that happens in this community because Santa Cruz is not an island. Um, it was 200 years ago. That's why we had the Oregon Trail. So just to kind of pay attention with what's going on and what else could be done, uh, I guess I'll leave it at there because otherwise I'd be con construed as being mean. But thanks, guys. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us on this budget item? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you again. Um, I just want to say the thought of raising taxes is just ridiculous. You can't bleed money out of turnips. And all of us are also personally feeling personally feeling cash strapped. So um, for me, I make decisions based upon how much I'm going to be spending and luxury items or items that I don't need for my immediate needs go by the wayside. So I think that if you try to raise taxes rather than cutting spending, you're going to put businesses out and you're going to inflame a situation. I haven't heard anything about cutting expenses. There's a lot of frivolous um, ideas about parks. And while I love the idea of having parks, if you're having a budget crisis, then stop the, stop the wasteful spending. We currently have a non- functioning judicial system in Santa Cruz County. We have two high profile crimes of judicial child trafficking, one by Judge Connolly 
and videos that have been seen by both um, child victims who were brutally kidnapped in the same Santa Cruz neighborhood have been viewed publicly over 30 million times. We have police officers, we have sheriff's department who are not doing their staff. We are very much pension heavy, um, government employee heavy. How about cutting some of the expenses there? How about getting rid of these judges and this useless justice system? The district attorney has hung up on victim advocates. He's not doing his job. The victim's advocates, such as Julia Schneider at um, Santa Cruz Police Department and others, just hang up on victims. This is ridiculous. So I'd like to hear your ideas on cutting the spending and just getting down to critical measures. If too much of our property taxes are going out of this community, yes, then it's your job to take it to the state and say that we want our property taxes here and we will decide. And um, yeah, work on cutting the spending just like home homeowners do. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? Good morning. Welcome. Good morning, board members. Joe Hall, uh, Live Oak resident. Uh, I'm actually here to thank you. Uh, it's been 10 years since we passed the vacation rental ordinance and Supervisor Koenig and Supervisor Friend took the lead and we're finally getting some enforcement. And it's I could say it's about time, but it's really overdue. And what you have basically are a lot of businesses and a lot of them know they don't have to even pay attention. But before I get into one other quick thing, I wanted to thank Nicole Coburn, who actually was part of the group that helped produce the funding that produces this position. So thank you, Nicole. She did a very quiet job, never got any public recognition. So you get it a little bit now. So thank you. Um, what I also wanted to show you why you need to do enforcement is things are getting trickier out there. Here's an example. I'll pass it around. It's a house on 8th Avenue overlooking Twin Lakes State Beach. And what they have done, I've seen in other communities, is they have come out with this proposal that you can only rent it for 30 days. That way you're not subject to the vacation rental ordinance. And so by doing that, if you rent this house, you'll end up paying $34,734, but none of that is taxed under the TOT because it's 30 days. And I know other cities have uh, based this in communities and they've actually, I think, come up with some legislative solutions. A neighbor called this to my attention and I was rather aghast thinking of $34,734. So there's $3,000 if you figure out how to deal with this that the county would get every month. Now, I don't know if it's rented. I walk by there all the time. I see cars there. I don't know how they get around it. But what's sad about it is that right around it, just look at the red dots of all the people who have vacation rental permits. This one doesn't. So they're basically skating under the radar. And that's why enforcement's important. It, it reinforces the people who do follow the law. And as a bonus, you could get some additional funding. I'll give this to your staff here. And thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Mr. Hall. And thank you for your steadfast advocacy on this. It's appreciated. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us on this item? Good morning and welcome back. Hello, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. Um, I, I appreciate these mid-year budget reports and I've listened to them over the years that I've been coming to the Board of Supervisors meeting. What I didn't hear you talk about at all that has been discussed at length in the past at this, this time is the amount of unfunded PERS liability. Um, that has been huge in the past and I didn't hear it discussed at all. So um, where do we stand in that? I've seen dire predictions of um, even larger deficits <laughs> than what you're predicting here uh, connected with the unfunded PERS liability. I appreciate uh, your discussion, Supervisor Koenig, about uh, going to the state and saying, hey, you need to give us back our money. And that um, brings me to my conversation I had recently with a fire chief about ERAF. And that that was a travesty that has never been undone. So we could be we should be getting more money back in our community from the state. And they said they would, but they never have. Supervisor Chairman Friend, you're up in Sacramento. Why don't you advocate for that up there while you're there now? The TOT compliance officer is something we have to do. It's what we promised the voters at the ballots when that went to, to vote. So that should not even be a question. And it is going to provide relief for those who voted for the tax and, um, and needs to be addressed with the problems in the communities where these things are. 
I think I appreciate uh, Supervisor Hernandez why you uh, that you ask why is um, the cannabis tax going down so much, and I think we need to be having conversations with those who are licensed and why they um, why that is happening. I'm sure they can fill you in. I ask a question, why is FEMA reimbursement so low? There have been questions about the county's problems with reporting. And I think we need to be talking about that as well. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, there is. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. Carolyn Garrett, um, I think the problems here, besides what you uh, enumerated upon, is overall that we're living in a corporate dictatorship where the corporations are ruling and siphoning off money from local governments and everywhere. Um, also, one half of our tax dollars approximately go to the military Pentagon budget, and that's coming from us taxpayers. I didn't vote for that. First, do no harm. First, do no harm is something medical professionals are supposed to abide by, but also elected representatives. I know ways you can save money and the broadband 4G, 5G radiation assault. This radiation is also known to kill wildlife and bees. We have a large agricultural South County um, business production and is negatively impacted by this and by the pesticides. You should require ecological and organic agriculture without poisons. Many farmers know how to do that. And this pandemic that we've had, part of the plan is for pharmaceutical telecom corporations to rule and not have local representation at all. So those are some of my overview comments and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there anybody else online, Madam Clerk? We have no further speakers, Chair. We'll bring it back to the board. I believe Supervisor Cummings, you had some comments? Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, one of them, thank you. Um, your microphone, Supervisor. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. First, uh, I'd just like to thank our staff for this update and presentation. Uh, very sobering to you know get a glimpse of what our financial situation is like, and definitely highlights the need for us to you know start thinking of creative ways to raise revenue for our community or for the county, so that we can continue to offer services to the public. Um, the comment, though, that I really wanted to make uh, has to deal with the budget hearings. Um, as a new supervisor, I mean, obviously the budget is pretty complex and, uh, I think that it would be good for us to receive presentations from all the departments, not just the largest ones, because it's our first opportunity to really understand, um, you know, what different departments are facing, even the smaller ones within the county. Um, I think it'll be really critical for us to just, and for the public, you know, for the purposes of transparency, for everyone to get a sense of where these different departments are facing their, um, what their successes are and where their shortcomings uh, are and what challenges they'll be facing uh, budgetarily and monetarily in the future. And so um, I'm happy to move the staff recommendation with an additional motion to extend the budget hearings from two days to four days and to receive presentations from all county departments. Oh, oh yeah, I'll second that. You know, I think that I'm being a new board member too. I think I appreciate, you know, learning from different departments. Um, you know, I appreciated, you know, uh, visiting some of the departments and learning about some of the budgetary issues shortfalls, uh, things to look forward to, some of the projects they're working on. And, you know, being a new new supervisor, you know, I think it's important, you know, even for me to like be able to prioritize things 
that are in my district, right? And I think, you know, and to figure out how to how to do that, you know, like for me, for example, I've got things like, you know, rural roads that were mentioned earlier, road repairs. And so for things like me, like Murphy Crossing Road is important to our local agricultural economy in South County, and I want that as a priority. And so, you know, figuring those things out, you know, I think these uh, longer meetings that have more explanation and we can have more in-depth discussion, I think are important to me, at least for, for right now, you know, where when we're new uh, incoming supervisors, I think would be good. So I, I you know, I support this motion. Uh, Supervisor Cummings has. Well, let me, let me just add a little bit of context. I'll open it up for my other colleagues, but um, as somebody who served on the board with Supervisor McPherson for a while, uh, when we first joined, this was more of a common practice that we would have presentations from um, a lot of the departments. Um, it took a significant amount of staff time uh, to put together these presentations for what really became pro forma actions of adoption of, say, the information technology budget or some of the smaller departments that you reference supervisor coming. So it is a significant onus actually on county staff time. Uh, there was a, a speaker that had asked, uh, what about what about cutting costs? Well, the county's down almost, I mean, about 17% staff from the point that when we first came into office about 10 years ago, but yet uh, the workload is, has increased exponentially. So um, I'm not really support, and also I'll say that the board actually adopted the budget hearing schedule. This was, um, they've already presupposed and planned for that exact schedule. And, and there's other things that are built around it, including some of the other commissions that we serve on uh, have scheduled their meetings around like the air board, for example, to schedule their meetings around when we release our early schedule on. So it becomes problematic that there's conflicts with other commissions. So I think if this is something we're interested in doing, I think that it's a broader discussion than today. I mean, which is to say that it impacts the scheduling of other commissions. Uh, this was not the expectation we'd given staff when we adopted the budget schedule previously. And uh, we need to give them the time and resources to be able to, to do it. I mean, I understand uh, the thought process behind it. And I also like to encourage as new supervisors, I mean, you're not limited to conversations with county staff on budget day, right? I mean, th these are meetings like for you, Supervisor Hernandez, everything you brought up was clearly brought up repeatedly by your predecessor. And these are meetings you should be having with uh, Public Works and others in it well in advance. Of, of budget hearings. So that's my concern about the expansion to multiple days. I'm not opposed to like the concept of additional meetings uh, associated with it. We've already been through this. Um, meaning we used to do this, it used to be uh, double the length. I think it was five full days originally. Uh, but there was a there was a strong preference both by the board at the time, as well as county staff to, to not just receive standard presentations on things that we were just adopting pro forma, but to really do deeper dives then into the departments uh, that had that received more cons more um, interest like public works or planning, for example, or the sheriff's office, the DA. So that, that's the history on it. So I, I can't support that element of the motion. That's the only reason why, but I mean, I recognize you, you'll be chair next year and this board toward the end of the year will be making a determination of what our schedule is for the coming year. And that should be built in at the expectation time at that time, uh, in my opinion, if that's something that the board wants to, wants to do. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I generally agree with you that uh, given how limited staff's time is, as you said, they're being asked to do more with less, um, that I would encourage my colleagues to have those conversations with departments, you know, it, outside of the budget hearings themselves. Um, I think that, you know, just establishing those relationships in general are going to be beneficial and help make you uh, most effective supervisors possible. Um, and other than that, I, you know, just wanted to add some, propose some additional direction as far as um, adding an, an item for our county's legislative program. But I don't know if we want to take a motion, a vote on this motion first or how you want to address that. Well, Supervisor Coney, we could do it one of two ways. There is a motion and a second. You could introduce an, a substitute motion and then we would take the substitute motion first. Okay. Yeah, then I will make a substitute motion uh, for the recommended actions with the additional direction to add to the county's legislative program an item advocating for change to sales tax and property tax apportionments to bring us <coughs> Santa Cruz County in line with statewide and, and historical averages uh, and direct the chair to write letters to state representatives and CSAC requesting action. Second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second and uh, uh, so we will need to take action on the secondary motion first. Supervisor McPherson, did you have any additional comments on the general 
uh, on either the motion or the uh, judgment. You know, you, you stated them uh, very clearly, I think, about why we are at the place and how we were going through our budget sessions today compared to several years ago. Um, I think that there's plenty of time between now and budget times for, and as I will do, uh, to talk to individual departments uh, about their budgets uh, when they come out and uh, their proposed budget when they come out. So I think we have plenty of time as supervisors to look at that. And uh, the history of it is, is that uh, it was pretty much a pro forma. It's not that we didn't uh, read it or do um, look at it, but it was pretty much locked in of what these departments, the if you'll excuse the term, minor departments, uh, what they were responsible for and how they were budgeting for it. So I, I would, uh, I'm supportive of the motion that is made. I think we should stick with the program as has been listed. And if we want to adjust it next year, let's have that discussion. All right, thank you. So we'll take a action on the alternate motion, or excuse me, the substantive motion, which includes the recommended actions, accept and file the mid-year report, adopt the various resolutions, uh, approve the addition of the code compliance investigator, and also, also authorize the auditor controller to make the necessary budget adjustments if we could, with, with the additional direction provided by Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Can I ask a point of order on this? So this this is a vote to accept the substitute motion and then we'll vote on the substitute motion after it's it's not a vote to accept the substitute motion the substitute motion is automatically heard under our rules um, in place of the original motion okay i just wanted to be clear on that because i think that there was a different process that i'm used to working under at the city so the substitute motion is now the motion that's on the floor and we won't consider the first motion that was made that's right under under rosenberg's uh rules of order um that's the way the business is conducted can you state motion? Uh, Supervisor Cummings, we would consider the original motion if the substitute motion fails. But if the substitute motion passes, then that is the only motion that's considered. And as I had already restated the substitute motion, it is for all the recommended actions in the agenda report, plus the additional direction that Supervisor Koenig outlined. So if we could have a, a roll call, please, Madam Clerk. Thank you. And the additional direction was to add to the county's legislative program, advocating for changes to sales tax and property tax apportionment to bring us in line with statewide and historical averages and direct the chair to write letters to state representatives and CSAC requesting action. All right, if we're ready. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? No. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. Item passes four to one with the substitute motion. Thank you. We have a 1045 scheduled item that we are unfortunately running a little bit late for. So uh, Mr. Pemmy, <laughs> we're gonna have to delay your items nine and 10 until after we hear uh, item 12. Mm -hmm. So we'll move on to item 12, which is a scheduled 1045. It's now 1105, but uh, which is to conduct a study session to review updates on addressing homelessness in the County of Santa Cruz and approve recommended priority goals for the next six month housing for a healthy Santa Cruz implementation cycle to accept and file various progress reports to defer ratification of project home key project agreement with 2838 Park Avenue LP and affiliates for the Park Haven Plaza project to on or before March 28th, 2023, to approve the appointment of Supervisor Cummings to the Santa Cruz County Housing for Health Partnership Policy Board through December 31st of 2023, and to direct the Human Services Department to return on or before August 22nd, 2023 with further updates and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Director of Human Services. We have the agenda board item and multiple attachments. And here for our presentation, we have, um, I believe we have uh, Mr. Morris and Mr. and Dr. Ratner. Uh, Mr. Morris, our Human Services Department Director and, and Dr. Ratner is our Housing for Health Director. Uh, Mr. Morris, please. Um, thank you, Chair Friend, and good morning to you and board members and to the public watching. Um, as you outlined, Chair Friend, um, just to add a touch of context, and then we'll pull up a PowerPoint from the uh, clerk of the board. Thank you. And Dr. Atner will go through a PowerPoint presentation. This is the two-year mark of a three-year strategic plan that your board adopted uh, just over two years ago and all four city councils in the community adopted as well, uh, called Housing for Healthy Santa Cruz. 
And we come back to your board under board direction every six months to provide a look back of what has been accomplished and what we're working through in the last six months. And then looking forward, what we recommend to staff to get direction from you to look going forward, given the landscape changes dramatically in the field of homelessness, funding issues, needs of the community. Um, I want to underline what Chair Friend said about the materials and just recognize that they are actually quite voluminous. Um, we put them together on purpose to do our best as staff to be very transparent and honest and direct, but we know the materials are overwhelming, but it is diagnostic of the complexity of the issue. And it is also uh, diagnostic of the amount of work we are attempting to do to address this issue, which um, unfortunately remains very complicated. Um, in the interest of being very focused, uh, today's presentation is not gonna go through all the materials. We are just gonna highlight the salient points that we think are of most interest. And I want to just take a minute to um, underline a few of um, a Chair Friend's comments about the six actions that are in front of you. Three of them are the very straightforward ones to open this hearing, to um, adopt and file the materials, and to come back in six months. But I do want to take a minute to be very clear why the other three actions are in front of you today. Um, there was a lot of comment earlier today in public comment about uh, transparency and Brown Act, et cetera. So I want to um, highlight with uh, District 3 Supervisor Cummings here as a uh, board member now, um, we are mandated by federal law under um, Housing and Urban Development and HUD to run locally something called a Continuum of Care or COC. We worked very closely with your board over the last couple of years to adjust how that system runs and to have four county seats on that um, body. Um, and one of those seats was uh, former District 3 Supervisor Ryan Coonerty. So to be honest and transparent and follow Brown Act, we're coming back to follow longstanding practice of having the new elected uh, Supervisor Cummings uh, to replace during that term. So that's why that's in front of you as a specific action and Supervisor Cummings has um, def definitely expressed his interest to, to do that given the issues in his district. <laughs> Um, the second is a deferral item. Um, we are dealing with a lot of money coming and going and a lot of complexity in state reporting. And we had committed to returning to board today on a project home key item in Supervisor Koenig's district. And there's still some I dotting and T crossing with the state and with the housing developer that we need a couple um, extra weeks to return. So we have a deferral item. And then the last one is because of the volume and the time frames of the funding opportunities we have with state and federal grants, we are consistently unable to follow practice and expectation to come to your board to ask approval to apply for grants because if we do that we actually miss the window to apply so we keep coming back to you and saying please ratify after the fact that we made this application and we were just being very transparent with you and asked for this action for your board to consider approving that this is just the nature of the funding and ask for your approval. This is what we're, we have been doing. We want to do ongoing that in no way eliminates um, your opportunity to look at when that money comes in, what to do with it, how to appropriate. It's just to apply for grants because we, they, they, the turnaround time is very, very quick. Um, last comment I want to make before turning it over to Dr. Ratner for the presentation is I've been in the field of safety net county government for over 30 years, and I am not sure I have seen a topic where there is more emotion, more complexity, and more of a distance between the facts and the challenges and the complexity and how conversations play out everywhere, including in public hearings. And so I just wanted to take take a minute to share sort of what I hope we are doing um, in interest of this community and for you as our elected officials. Um, the emotions run deep and there are often finger pointing in every forum we're at about why, what's the problem, who's the cause, where it's going. There is a lot of rhetoric, particularly um, in light of a uh, budget that is looking very um, concerning. We actually even have a governor who has arguably been the biggest champion of funding homeless services at local level, who has shifted as we prepare for a, a budget recession at the state level, facing a 30 plus billion dollar deficit to the problem is not state funding. The problem is local accountability. We disagree. Um, we think this is part of how political rhetoric plays out and makes it very confusing for people and makes it very challenging for us. And on the heels of the budget presentation that just um, occurred, we want to be very clear and honest that we are facing what we're going to call a cliff two. Cliff one is during COVID, we got a huge infusion of federal and state money to stand up a lot of shelter programs and a lot of services, and that money went away. That was cliff one. We are now looking at a cliff two is a number of state and federal grants that are going to term out in the next two to three years. 
So this leads to, um, I'm going to end with the challenge, but I then want to uh, turn it over to Rob with a little bit of hope. The challenge, we are constantly confronted with the issue of what to do with declining revenues and need that surpasses the revenues and the tension of whether or not to respond to emergencies or plan and invest in long term so that people stop becoming homeless or stay housed. That tension will keep going. And our job as staff is to share with you those trade-offs share with you what we see as the opportunities and make sure the discussions are open and clear with everybody because they're not easy decisions. A little bit of hope. Um, in Robert's presentation, you will see that we have been successful based on an action for your board of being the most successful jurisdiction in the state of California of helping many people get housed who are in the project room key COVID shelter system more than any other community. There's a story to tell here that there are ways to invest and fund thoughtfully that keep people from being or becoming or returning to the streets. And so we hope as we deal with trade-off choices, emergency response choices and investments in stopping and ending homelessness. It's a complicated issue, but we feel we have a good story to tell. So I want to turn it over to Dr. Ratner and if we could lift up the PowerPoint. Thank you, Clerk of the Board. Thank you, Randy, and thank you, Board, for the opportunity to give you an update on the work we've been doing over the last six months. Uh, we're going to report on activities in our division between July and December of 2022, and this is um, the end of our second year of implementing the framework. Go on to the next slide, thanks. Um, this is what I'm planning to cover. As Randy said, I'm going to highlight some things in your packet and then want to save enough time for questions and comments from members of the Board. So I want to talk about how we're doing generally around the issue of homelessness. I think many people can see um, signs of progress and lack of progress in our community. Uh, what's working? I want to share, as Randy alluded to, examples of efforts that have made a difference in people's lives and talk about how we can scale that up. And then want to share a little bit more detail on some of the challenges given how the federal and state government addressed this issue and the complexity of braiding funding together to achieve outcomes um, is quite challenging and talk a little bit about that. I, I know the board is very interested in members of the public what's happening with shelter capacity and transitional housing capacity. So we consistently want to provide updates on that and what the landscape is looking like currently with funding and current programs. And then talk a little bit about what we're planning to work on the next six months. On the bottom of this slide, I wanted to highlight in preparing for today's meeting, I did a little bit of historical research and found this article from 1990 in an editorial in a public health journal. That's my background in healthcare and public health. And it referred to homelessness as a game of musical chairs. And in that editorial, the author highlighted, and you can see in the quote, that homelessness is primarily a problem in our country of making sure we have enough housing that's affordable for the people who live in a community and the incomes that they have. And um, in 1990, this was called out as the major reason why we have homelessness. And I will allude to this later in my talk. In 2022, there's a new book from some professors at the University of Washington that says homelessness is a musical chairs problem. And the primary driver is we don't have enough affordable housing. So ultimately, what at the local level, what we're faced with, it, until we collectively in our society invest more in making sure we have affordable places for people to live, we have to make difficult choices about people who are better off and not better off given this game. And in the game of musical chairs, there aren't enough options for people. So where we invest our time and money are the groups that tend to be more likely to get into housing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that more. And, and there's some statewide trends uh, where the state is putting in money and we are locally where you see progress in addressing homelessness and other groups where we're not investing money and time and we're seeing increases in homelessness. And I think those are important trade-off decisions that policymakers make when we're looking at budgets. And I know you have really difficult decisions to make around those budget issues. We're going to the next slide, thanks. So how we're doing, I, members of the board, I think at our last meeting, you are aware that we did a point in time count comparing the data in 2019 and 2022. Last week, a group of volunteers, I want to shout out to all the people who helped uh, do another count, a survey of people who are unhoused. We'll have data on that by the end of April um, and the full report will come out in the fall. Overall homelessness went up 6% in our county and the number of unsheltered people went up 4%. 
and the number of deeply low income households. And that's a, a category that's not actually used a lot in the housing world because uh, the housing world is concerned with people with higher incomes, but people with seniors and people with disabilities, people who are on public benefits managed by our department are in this deeply low income category where we don't invest enough in creating more affordable housing options for them. They're competing for limited housing slots. And the groups that are more likely to end up homeless are in that income category. And then where we do make investments, you'll see certain groups are better off. So on this slide, you'll see that um, in our point in time count, last time we saw reductions in homelessness among families with children. And this community has invested heavily in making sure children and families are in stable living situations. And we have saw progress there. The same is the case for young people ages 18 to 25, where we've collectively made more investments. And then groups that are not doing as well, seniors, um, it came up in the dental presentation earlier. We have an aging population statewide. There's a growing number of seniors who are losing their housing. That is the case here as well in Santa Cruz. Um, veterans, this is an outlier in our community um, that we're going to see if this was an anomaly in the point in time count or if there's an actual trend in seeing increased numbers of veterans. But between 2019 and 2022, there was. Then these other groups statewide, we saw increases. So people with disabilities, particularly people with disabilities that impact their ability to function and their, their brain activity, mental health, substance use, dementia, those kinds of health issues have significant impacts on people's ability to maintain housing. People with histories of criminal justice involvement, there's a lot of barriers to returning to work and getting back into housing. And it should not surprise us that as the state has reduced the number of people in prisons and jails, there aren't enough options and supports for people who have those personal histories. And that's an area for some attention. We continue to have significant racial disparities in who ends up um, homeless. And between 2019 and 2022, we saw an increase in the number of Hispanics and Latinos, uh, which is actually a trend that is not, hasn't been the case. Um, Hispanic Latinos have not seen significant increases in homelessness until this pandemic era. And so this is a statewide trend we need to pay much more attention to. And then uh, since modern homelessness became a thing that government has tracked, uh, Blacks and African Americans have been overly represented. So we need to tend to the racial disparities in this issue as well. I did want to share that the board uh, six months ago approved of our department using some funds to help with the ending of the housing is key program. It's an emergency rental assistance program during COVID to help people who are struggling to pay rent. Um, and the board authorized us to invest $500,000 in some local nonprofits to help outreach to the applicants to housing is key and to help as many people as possible keep their housing. I'm pleased to report that the nonprofits have done really good work. They've outreached to over 1,400 people um, and 1,100 people compared to when we had data in February and uh, early in 2023. 1,100 new households got assistance from the Housing is Key program, and that brought in $13.6 million. Uh, can't directly correlate, but I think there is a correlation between us locally investing in supporting nonprofits to follow up with families and individuals. Very positive that those resources were here. And then the, the other side of the coin is that even with these local efforts, we had hundreds of households that still weren't able to keep their housing because their incomes couldn't keep up the cost and rising rents and people selling homes, et cetera. So I think there were over 280 households, according to the nonprofit reports, that weren't able to keep their housing. That doesn't mean that they became homeless, but it does mean they can't afford to live here and they may need to live elsewhere or move in with others and doubled up often in overcrowded situations. And go on to the next slide. So what is working on a positive note, uh, Randy alluded to our work with the project room key. And I do hope we get our FEMA reimbursements like all of you as soon as possible. One of the areas where we invested heavily was in creating safe places for people experiencing homelessness uh, during COVID to, to land and to be safe from the virus. The federal government also made available, which we need on a much larger scale, some special vouchers called emergency housing vouchers for people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. And we braided money together from multiple sources to create what we call a rehousing wave program. And we worked closely with the housing authority to make these vouchers work. When I started here, I heard a lot that vouchers are just a piece of paper that are useless. And uh, I had worked in another community and I knew that having a voucher to subsidize your rent is hard to use in a private market. 
I think you need a graduate degree to be able to navigate the process of getting a voucher and understanding it and being able to use it. So what we did is we paid for service providers to work with our clients to help them navigate the process of using the vouchers. And then we also created incentives and supports for private property owners. It's also complicated if you're a property owner to understand where do you go for help? What does this form mean? What's HQS? Um, what's AMR, um, all these different jargon terms and acronyms. So together by working on this as a collective and bringing funding together, we have the highest utilization of these vouchers in California. And this is the 13th highest in the US, but we're actually 10th. It went up because we've got more people using vouchers. Uh, we've exceeded our allocation and we're lobbying the federal government to get more of these vouchers because what we're doing is working. 188 property owners and managers are partnering with us and helping households move into housing in the private market. And 57 of those property owners are new to the program. So our outreach efforts, our incentives are bringing in new property owners who I'm incredibly proud of the fact that they are contributing to being a part of the solution by participating in these programs and working with us. We helped over 295 households that were homeless move into permanent housing, and that includes over 425 individuals. That's balanced against the people who are getting displaced and losing housing in the community. Um, the next slide, um, we can go ahead, is like, how did this work? How did we do this? And uh, I, I think it comes from taking money from all these different sources, braiding them together to create a, a model that thinks about how do we help people go from being in their cars or places where the folks shouldn't be sleeping into a safe place. And this diagram is the hotels, the project room key, but any shelter that's low barrier that is welcoming to people, but shelter is not enough. If all we do is shelter, people will just stay in shelter. We have to braid that with the services and supports to help people get back into permanent housing. So that's the middle part of this diagram, the service providers who build relationships and re help people reconnect with family and friends and take advantage of money that we have, apply for affordable housing, et cetera. And then helping folks move and transition from homelessness into permanent homes. But we also need to wrap around the services with the property owners. Um, property owners, um, have a lot of questions, need support with navigating these public programs. And then once folks move in, many people have significant health issues, as I alluded to earlier, where they need that ongoing support to be able to keep their housing. Uh, and then I think the incentives for the property owners makes a big difference. We provide incentives for or, or um, owners that are participating. We help them understand if there are issues that come up, there's some resources to help in that situation. And then we give them some phone numbers to call if there are challenges. Using subsidies in the private marketplace is more expensive. A cheaper, uh, but takes longer to do, is building housing in our community with the intention. So over the long run, it's a lot cheaper to build housing with some units targeted to people who have special needs, seniors, people with disabilities. So over the long run for government, that's a cheaper approach. Right now we haven't built enough. So we have to partner with the private market and use these vouchers. So it costs more per household to use that kind of approach. We can go on to the next one. This is a picture that um, artistically represents the maze of funding that um, we navigate in our division. We get funding from the federal and state um, governments, different agencies. We have currently 46 different funding sources. And that doesn't include money that goes into other agencies like probation and the health service agency also get money to address homelessness. Um, each funding source has different rules and different contracts and levels of staff support on the end of the fund, the funding agency that can help us understand the rules, et cetera. There's different start and end dates and deadlines and reporting requirements and reporting systems. So we spend a lot of our time as staff navigating and braiding this funding together to try to get outcomes. It's a lot of wasted taxpayer dollars, to be honest with you. The amount of time I spend, the amount of time my, my coworkers spend, and all of this work, we'd rather be helping people move into housing. So the extent that the federal and state government can make it easier and consistent with the funding that we receive and be more predictable, we can have a much bigger impact on our communities. I just read on my phone this morning that there's um, some state legislators who are pushing for legislation to have more consistent ongoing funding at the state level. As you can tell, I'm personally supportive of that as a staff and would encourage the board to think about weighing in on those recommendations at the state level. Next one. 
so this is related to how much does it actually cost to implement the framework that we adopted um, in March of 2021. The framework that we have currently that we're working from did not include budget numbers and going forward, I recommend to the board and to my colleagues that we really be more transparent about how much things actually cost. So our framework called for a reduction in homelessness of 25%. And based on calculations that are in your packet, I estimate that's around $78 million per year that were needed to implement that framework fully. The current funding on the graph below shows where we are. We have a $39 million gap um, to that total. And of the money that we have, 14 million is housing subsidies. So I mentioned those housing subsidies earlier, and that's not the only source. It's important to remember the housing subsidies are really homelessness prevention. When people see them listed, they think, oh, there's $14 million to help people who are currently homeless get into housing. No, housing subsidies are to help people afford to live here. If they lost those subsidies, they would often lose their housing again. Uh, then state and federal grants, $12 million. Um, other grants that we receive uh, as a department, there's county general fund and city contributions, and then we have that gap. So the state and federal grants and the other grants are unstable. So depending on what policymakers at the federal and state level do with the allocation, their budget allocations and their programs, 23 million of the 39 million um, is not stable. We have in our department taken multi-year grants and spread them out over uh, several years to try to smooth the edges off these peaks and valleys of funding. So we're often asked what's happening with all of the money that you received. We're actually spreading it out over multiple years. So we don't start a program and close it, start a program and close it. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, this is a slide about our shelter goals and shelter in this context means temporary housing and emergency shelter. So the goal in the framework is 600 beds. Currently we're below that. We're uh, I think 461 and the graph on the body, the bottom shows where the funding is coming through to support those shelter and transitional housing programs. So 217 of the beds are funded through our division in some fashion or supported not entirely by us, but we're involved. Another 184 are supported by private fundraising or those nonprofits going after money on their own. That's an unstable source of shelter. Um, when private donations go down or other public sources diminish, those shelters struggle. It's come to my attention that several of those shelters in that 184 are struggling. So they're at risk of closing or having to cut back staff or beds. The city of Santa Cruz received a $14 million one-time allocation from the state to help them address homelessness. Um, Supervisor Cummings, you're aware of this. And that helped increase some capacity, but that was one-time money. So that money is at risk of not being available to sustain those extra 60 beds. And then we have that gap. Um, in your board packet, I referenced the fact that we're as staff working with other partners to go after some grant funding to start up some new shelter and expand capacity. To sustain it, we need to partner with our managed care plans because the one stable source of revenue for temporary housing right now is through Medi-Cal, the health insurance system, and partnering with the Central California Alliance for Health. All the other shelter money we have is very unstable. In the board packet, there's a recommendation and given the budget context you all are working under, I know it's a very challenging request, but the amount of funds that are coming from city and county contributions to shelter, to the extent that we can look at expanding that, uh, it will help stabilize the universe of temporary housing. And as that gets more stable, I think the outcomes improve. When people know there's a stable place as staff member or a stable place where I can go, the outcomes are more likely to increase. So one thing to consider during the budget season is if and how and when multiple levels of government can increase the base funding for shelter and transitional housing in the county. And what are we working on the next six months? We're making some major shifts in areas where the federal government expects us to manage uh, how we approach homelessness. There's something called coordinated entry, how homeless individuals access services and how we assess and prioritize people to get connected to programs. HMIS is a fairly mandated data system that we, um, our COC board adopted some new policies and procedures. We're gonna implement them. 
I want to keep supporting building more permanent supportive housing. The board has supported us applying for home key funds on the consent agenda. You authorized us to uh, release an RFP for the next round of home key funding. We were very successful the last round. We got three or four projects approved. I think we can do that again. I anticipate we can get at least two projects approved in the next round. And we need to keep working on expanding affordable housing. Uh, I alluded to the stabilizing the funding and temporary housing in the community. Learning from what works, the rehousing wave, how do we do more of that? How do we expand that and keep it going? And then a big area where there's funding opportunities in the, is in the health services and with Medi-Cal. So helping our organizations learn how to go from being housing providers to health providers and building for services. And it's really complicated. And it's going to take probably a year plus of work to help our nonprofit community and even our own county government to learn how to work with managed care and bill for services. And then uh, I alluded to the desire of trying to stabilize that puzzle, that funding landscape, that maze that we as staff have to deal with. If as policymakers, we can make it more predictable and stable uh, where the funding comes from, we'll get better outcomes for the community. And that's my presentation, open it up for questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Ratner. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, this is a, a full house or a mouthful or whatever. But you know, when members of the community read and uh, this comprehensive report, my hope is that they grasp the complexity of this issue. It is beyond belief of uh, what we're trying to deal with and, and everybody else in this state as well. And I'm grateful that our CAO, Carlos Palacios, and the board approved the creation of our housing for health office several years ago uh, so we can give some con concentrated focus on what we want to do. And even though the county has developed a strategic plan and garnered uh, millions of dollars in grant money um, and from state and federal agencies, um, the county is ser seriously under-resourced. I mean, you said the need to really address and get to accomplish our goals was 78 million a year, I think, and we're only halfway there. And it's through no fault of our own. That's a huge success story. And so I wanna compliment you on that. Um, yeah, we wanted to do it all, but we're doing better than most. And so I, I really wanna congratulate you and this county and uh, addressing this thing is, this issue is something that we all hear more than anything else. And, uh, it's to coordinate the effort is so critical. I think there was 14 different agencies in the state that were looking at homelessness and I don't know, to try to get it all together. And that's a big problem from the from the get-go from the state. But uh, I don't wanna say I don't appreciate what they do give to this county. And one of the most uh, positive shifts that I've seen in this dialogue um, is uh, from the 25 years ago is how we talk about the core causes of homelessness. homelessness. It's really complicated. Um, the health services aspect of it is critical. Uh, I think the estimate is that maybe uh, half of those people at least that are in need of homelessness are in uh, need of behavioral services as well. So uh, that's how it gets just beyond the housing aspect of it all itself. Um, it's a better, um, one of the most positive shifts, like you said, is that we've, we've tried to coordinate that effort. And um, uh, they, these reports reflect the nuanced uh, approach that we're taking to provide the services that are needed. And um, I think that uh, it's worth, uh, it's what it's going to take is uh, we hope to continue moving in the right direction. And it, probably the, the start of that is keeping people who are in house, uh, have housing, keep them there. This don't add to the problem. And I know we had just our point in time reference. I don't know when though, I'm curious to know when that number is supposed to come out. I think it was 2,500 two years ago or in that range. And uh, if you have any guesstimate or uh, what that what that point in time or PIT was. Um, I, I just really want to think that you should be complimented and we should be complimented in the coordinated efforts we've had with our cities to reducing the homelessness uh, among families and women in particular and the young people. Um, this is an important goal set by our county and I hope we can make even more progress with the individuals experiencing homelessness. Uh, it's a task that uh, is monumental in front of us. I know that, I think that each and every one of us, we hear about this issue more than anything else uh, that we address. And it's a highly cost, a costly, 
uh, uh, situation uh, problem that we have to address. And we're only getting halfway there with the funding from the federal and state resources that we need. So I want to congratulate you on the successes that we've had, uh, the more participants that we've had. Um, we have a long way to go. I think we're on the right track and you're to be highly complimented for getting us there. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Are there others that would like to comment on the item? Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, I want to thank you all for the presentation. Um, definitely underscores the need for, you know, not only housing, but policies that are going to help people stay in their homes. Um, because while we're making progress with building and the state to put pressure on, um, you know, local communities to build more housing. They've also done that with a lot of unfunded mandates. You know, we don't have the funding from the state to build the very low and low that they're requiring us to build. And, um, you know, I think my big concern is that we're in overdeveloped market rate housing and underdevelop a lot of the low and very low income housing and middle income housing that we really need for our workforce. Um, but I do want to just thank you all for the hard work um, that you all have been doing on this topic. I know that Robert, you came on, I think in 2020. And so, you know, just the County making that uh, commitment to having someone who's dedicated to working on homelessness, I think, is um, is progress. Um, and so, I think you all are doing a great job. And also with the you know being able to secure the housing vouchers and get people in the housing and putting us in the national ranking for housing people who are homeless, I think is is a great thing that we should all celebrate. And you know, hopefully, we can get more resources so that we can house more people. Um, the one thing that I did want to um, just two brief comments. Um, one is that I think from what you've highlighted is that, you know, the people who are really experiencing homelessness have been um, kind of underinvested in historically. You know, we have African-Americans, Latinos who, who've um, faced the highest rates of poverty when compared to others. Um, also, um, overrepresented in the criminal justice system, which then was another population that you highlighted. Um, and then, you know, seniors, so people who are on fixed income, that's also very, um, you know, underserved population along with people who are experiencing mental health issues. And so I think it really does underscore the inequities that we've seen within um, our society historically that are also reflected in our homelessness population here in Santa Cruz. But one thing that I did really want to um, to touch on is that, you know, we're, we're now seeing, um, we're now in a new shift as well, where we have an aging landlord population, um, many of whom have, you know, kept rents low for the tenants who've lived in their buildings, um, others who have not. And, uh, and the, the issue is that as we see those people aging out of that industry and that profession, the turnover of these homes are going to end up just becoming more market rate homes, right? So we're going to be losing a lot of our affordable housing. And I, I think it would be good for the county in conjunction with the other cities to just try to get a sense of what that housing stock looks like. Um, because within the next five to 10 years, I mean, we're on that cliff right now um, where we're going to see a lot of those houses um, come out of being affordable in those affordable categories. And a lot of those people who are living there right now are either going to go into homelessness or they're going to leave. And we know that a lot of those folks um, fill the kind of middle class and working class uh, population here in our community. And I know that the county has been struggling, the cities have been struggling to, you know, find a uh, workforce to provide these services. And it's just going to get worse unless we really figure out how we can keep people housed. And so I know it's, you know, one, one more thing to add on to this, you know, big issue of homelessness, but, you know, the turnover in affordable homes from affordable to market rate is going to be another major factor that's going to impact uh, people going into homelessness. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Any additional comments from board members? Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair Friend. You know, first, I'll, I'll just say I certainly agree with Supervisor Cummings on the need to maintain a diversity of housing stock so that we can have a, a vibrant community of people of all incomes, in, income levels. Um, and in fact, to that point, maybe, uh, I mean, it might be something you have to think about more, but um, what could we do? What, what kinds of housing could we incentivize in order to make sure that we, that we have those, that different housing stock? I mean, um, Dr. Ratner, you'd mentioned you know, needing senior housing. I mean, should we be incentivizing the creation of 55 plus housing or um, Section 8 housing? What is there anything off the top of your head that we could do in our housing policy to make sure that we have more these kinds of housing options? 
Oh, there are many, many, many debates on this policy issue. Um, from my personal perspective, I think things that we can do to incentivize more mixed developments, mixed affordability and mixed target populations. One of the things that is happening with a lot of housing policy and funding now is that we're creating very segregated housing communities where many of the people moving in are either people who are um, ex histories of experiencing homelessness with health conditions. Some of the more successful projects I've been involved with my, in my career and uh, the project on Capitola was mentioned earlier where the dental clinic, that's a mixed affordable housing development community where there's some workforce housing, 30% of area median income, 50% of area median income with some units for people experiencing homelessness. I think we need to do a lot more of those integrated kinds of housing developments that um, create the housing that people who want to live and work here need to be able to afford to live here, but also for seniors and people living on fixed incomes who aren't going to increase their income because of health issues or their age. Um, so that I'd like to see a lot more of those developments and that that would require changes at the federal, state, and local level and, and multiple policy areas. And I, I can think about ways in which we could look at incentivizing that. I think you all will be very involved with the RENA discussions, the regional housing needs allocation discussions. And as we as staff and you as policymakers look at that, I, I think figuring out how we can incentivize more of those mixed affordability projects, I personally would be very supportive of that. Um, it also makes it easier to get the kinds of additional subsidies you need to make the units that are targeted to seniors and people with disabilities work. Because if you have higher income paying tenants in a mixed unit, it makes it easier to manage the whole project. If you have a whole project with people living on fixed incomes, it's a lot harder to make that project pencil financially over the long haul. I, I would like to just supplement it with a, a comment. I hope the candor is welcome. It's very honest and to the point. I think that unfortunately in communities like Santa Cruz and many like it who prioritize um, environmental issues, these end up coming a competition between environmental causes and affordable housing. And I think the secret sauce is something I want to recognize and appreciate not only our CEO, your board and last budget hearing, giving us more staff capacity to have those conversations with community. Because what happens is lack of conversation with community, the stereotypical image jumps up in people's heads of an encampment. And as soon as an affordable housing project gets lifted up, people immediately jump to a conclusion. I, I don't in any way, shape or form and as a homeowner myself with children um, minimize or question or judge that. But I think talk, having capacity to talk with community and explain what the goal is, as Dr. Ragnar just listed, takes time. So your board approved an extra position. Robert's in the process of hiring an extra position. And we are going to try to have more conversation with community. So hopefully this can be less of a competition between environmental interests and affordable housing. That's not an easy issue, but I think with time and conversation with community, we might be able to push through some of these projects with less frustration and finger pointing. All right, well, thank, thank you for those general suggestions. And I'm sure we can get into more details, as you said, as the uh, housing element proceeds this year and we look at the, those arena numbers. Um, you know, I just wanted to echo the, the thanks um, to both of you, Dr. Ratner and Director Morris for your focus on this, as well as to CAO Palacios for uh, creating the Housing for Health Division so that we have this level of attention uh, to really the biggest issue in our community of homelessness. Um, and I know a lot of the times uh, community members my, and myself included, we are just like, where's all the money going? Let's just drop everything and, and grab some hammers and nails and, and build some housing. Um, but the, the complexity of the funding streams really helps to demonstrate why we can't do that. Because if we did, all of a sudden there would be no money because no one was applying for all these complicated state and federal grants. Um, you know, I definitely support any advocacy with the state or federal government to simplify these uh, these grant streams. I mean, you'd mentioned that there might be a couple of um, of bills in progress at the state. Uh, you know, if you provide more information, I'd be happy to, you know, suggest that we support those. Um, because as you said, your time is better spent actually getting people into housing than just applying for, for money all the time. And then of course, as you said, also just needing to equalize those funding streams over multiple years, uh, manage, manage the requirements of each one of those grants. It's just so much work. Um, and, you know, finally, you know, I'm definitely in favor of providing more uh, money directly from our general fund to stabilize shelter options. You know, it's, we've got to reach this goal of at least 600 shelter beds. I know that, uh, you know, as you said, some of the private operators are really struggling with um, 
the funds that fluctuate that are there one year and not there the next and just uh, so much work to constantly stand up these operations and then take them down and stand them up again. And so consistency is really uh, something I think we should focus on in order to, to ultimately reach our goals. And so as we have that continued discussion about how we fund these programs, um, I'll definitely be an advocate for consistent funding from our general fund. Uh, Supervisor Coney, I, I neglected to mention something that this board considered related to your question about housing. And there is a state program called the Pro Housing Designation Program. And this board approved a direction to staff in the county to explore during this RENA process how to meet those pro housing designation requirements. I personally, as a medical person who learned about housing, see that as a, a playbook of things that we can do at the local level to increase housing production for all incomes. So I would encourage all of you and myself to get more informed about it during this arena process and encourage our colleagues in the cities to look at that as well um, as a, a playbook of things that we can do to increase housing development at all income levels. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, that is a great checklist, the pro housing designation. I know we'll, we're looking at it and we'll definitely a good reminder to look at it again and, and get more policies implemented here during the Reno and, and housing element process. That's all my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Are there any additional comments? I'll make some uh, brief comments. First off, is just one of appreciation, Dr. Ratner. One thing that I think is underappreciated of appreciated of work is how much work you do at the state level. Supervisor McPherson and I last night were actually on a meeting where you were uh, you were in, atten in attendance, but you were called out for your yeah. uh, remarkable advocacy and information that you provide at the state level. Nothing but positive comments. And uh, to Supervisor Koenig's comments regarding the simplifying and consolidating the processes. That's actually uh, one of the key points that I'm planning to raise today after this meeting when I uh, when I testify the assembly. Um, I mean, it's it's acronym SOUP, but HCD, CalICH, DHCS, DSS, all these federal government agencies, and every single one of them has a different application. Every single one of them has a different reporting processes. And just simply, I mean, one thing that, that could happen, at, the, at least at the state level, would be just simplifying or consolidating these processes for us as we do our applications. There's a lot more that can be done. But these numbers represent people, and uh, we have to recognize that even though there's been an increase in some of the subpopulations, uh, it goes to show how much pressure there is within the, the broader system that we can have this level of success and this level of investment and still see a nominal increase. Just think about what would, what, but but for those investments, what kind of situation we'd be facing within our community. And it goes to show how many lives have been helped. Another component of investment that I think that is underappreciated, at least in state investment, is, is protecting those before they actually fall into homelessness. There seems to be a significant interest. And in, uh, to quote the governor, you don't uh, get credit in, in politics for saves. Um, I think that that's exactly right. I think there should be a greater investment of those that are teetering on the possibility and ensuring that we we can keep people out of a system that has a or a cycle that has a, a detrimental outcomes. And to have greater investment on the early side of that would be would be important for our board to continue to advocate for. But but Dr. Ratner, you deserve a lot of praise for your advocacy, not just in our county, but your comments at the statewide level are helping impact statewide focus in regards to homelessness and behavioral health issues. So please take my appreciation on that. Uh, we'll open it up for the community now. Is there any member of the community in chambers that would like to address us on this item? Hi there. Thank you for that presentation. I had a few questions. I didn't see any demographics on homelessness. Um, and I believe a lot of the pressure for people not being able to afford homes. I was born here and raised here, and I've seen the cost of housing go up from $20,000 to when my parents first bought a home to $2 million. What kind of income do you need to have to have a $2 million home? I also, when I was at UCSC, my tuition was only $500 a quarter. And now I'm told that the tuition is 20,000 a quarter. So there's a lot of college debt and mortgage debt that is prohibiting people from having traditional homes. And while I find that really unfortunate, I know a lot of younger people have chosen an alternative lifestyle. They're having a diversified lifestyle by choosing to live in vans, choosing to live in RVs. And that's a much more affordable way um, to be able to have some sort of uh, autonomy and ownership. And what I see lacking here in Santa Cruz County are RV parks. 
We don't have any RV parks. I haven't seen any presentations on implementing those with dump stations and hookups. And I'm wondering if that could be something that we could consider because not everybody is homeless or that doesn't live in a house regards themselves as homeless. They're just living a diversified lifestyle by choice because they don't want to be in debt. And all housing is, is debt. The The interest rates and the mortgage rates are ridiculous. So um, I would just really, you know, hope that someone can make a comment to that. Um, obviously, we live in Silicon Valley and tech. And so there's a big, big disparity between the haves and the have nots. Um, tech people made a lot of money. They came in here, they bought up the houses and they kept driving the prices up with the with the pricing wars. And so those were issues that I, I don't know how we control any of that. Um, the average single family home I've been looking at is $6,000 a month to rent. The newer uh, two bedroom apartments are $3,000 a month. That's still so cost prohibitive. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Uh, yeah, N Nicholas Whitehead. Thank you, Dr. Ratner. That was very lucid. Appreciate it. Um, we have a lot of land in this county. In Mr. McPherson's district, there are these extensive former quarries and gravel pits. Um, the ownership of those might vary. Some were corporations. Um, I think I, I got a very interesting hint from a, a member of the planning department once. He said, we should get the um, the state to buy some of that land that was formerly used for um, quarries and have let the housing department of the state buy that and then hand, them, hand it over to us, either for ownership or use as a county for housing and shelter development. Um, that's one thing I'd like to see. I think we need a much more imaginative, creative approach uh, to attract the right kind of funding. Instead of having camps and shelters, we need to set up learning schools for homeless and other uh, low-income people where they can learn the skills of land renewal. There's a lot of land that, that needs, needs to have its natural habitat restored. If we could train people who say they want to live outside. Uh, if we could set up such training centers, the public would support it. The politicians would support that more. We have to have creative engagement with people who are unfortunately unhoused. They're, they're citizens with potential. Um, well, I probably said enough for now, but uh, I, I hope to be working with some of you on... Uh, on alternative proposals that would have a wider buy-in from the community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Welcome. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you to the two previous speakers for their questions and their creative solutions. Um, Mr. Morris, you will always be one of my heroes for getting the great plates program <laughs> put together. You helped a lot of people, both seniors as well as businessmen during COVID. So thank you. Um, I, I would like uh, the $78 million figure to solve this problem is a lot of money. I'd like to see a breakdown in, in that. And maybe it's in all of that. I can't, um, I, that needs to be discussed a bit more, I think. Um, and I saw that, um, the city of Santa Cruz contributes a um, certain number of beds for homeless. What about the city of Watsonville? Uh, there's definitely a the issue there too. And what about UCSC? That's a big contributor as well. We need to partner with everybody. I, I would hope that our county would look to uh, neighboring counties like Sonoma County and Alameda County and what they've done. Sonoma County, I think, did some very creative things with pallet shelters. Uh, Oakland did some very creative things with tough sheds. And I think that this board has approved money for um, 30 to 38 pallet shelters, but you're still trying to figure out where to put them. There are lots of places like in uh, Watsonville, behind the community health center. Um, maybe that big parking lot at Seacliff <laughs> that just sits there empty all the time. Um, also, we need to be, um, 
asking why 12 brand new trailers that the that were given to the county for COVID transitional youth sequestering were being then given when the money ran out were given to parks as offices that should be shelter for people thank we you. need to look at alternatives thank you is there any other member of the community that would like to address us in chambers we did at the for your good thank you Ms. Steinbrenner is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us on this item no wherever you Welcome. are Thank you. Hi, I'm Judy Hutchison, and I'm the board chair of the Association of Faith Communities. Dr. Ratner alluded to a funding, um, lack of funding for privately funded sheltering providers. And I'd like to encourage this board to really consider Manu's um, suggestion of adding more money from the general fund. Without that, your numbers are not going to look good. Half of us will be unable to continue to provide the level of service without additional funding. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else in chambers? I don't believe we have any further speakers in chambers, but we do have speakers online. Thank you, Madam Clerk. If we could move online then. Joseph, your microphone's now available. Thank you very much. Um, this is Father Joseph Jacobs. I'm also from Association of Faith Communities. I just want to uh, also thank Dr. Ratner and Director Morris for your good work on these issues. I um, recently sent an email over the weekend and Dr. Ratner suggested I make some comments um, at this meeting. So I just, in case you're not aware, I've been um, running the AFC Safe Spaces parking program for almost four years. And we're seeing increasingly uh, older and older people in this program. Nearly 50% of people in safe parking are age 60 and over. Over 20% of them are age 70 or old, and many of them are in their 80s. And this just continues to increase. Um, we are providing, uh, between the Faith Community Shelter and Safe Spaces Program, we're providing about 10% of your 600 shelter beds. And I really would like to see some kind of emphasis placed on helping elderly people who are losing housing in this county for a variety of reasons, many of them health related. Um, many people are just one uh, health crisis or one paycheck away from losing their housing. I would like to see more emphasis placed on helping people who are over age 60. And um, really that's my main point for today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any additional speakers, Madam Clerk? Yes, call in user three, your microphone is now available. So um, you just asked the question, where is the money going? And to contextualize this, actually, I'd like to quote from a book here. And the section is Enriching the Wealthy. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Ratner for his um, very informative, disturbing report. Enriching the Wealthy. This is from the book, The Real Anthony Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health. Dr. Fauci's business culture closures pulverized America's middle class and engineered the largest upward transfer of wealth in human history. In 2020, workers lost $3.7 trillion, while billionaires gained $3.9 trillion. Some 493 individuals became new billionaires, and an additional 8 million Americans dropped below the poverty line. The biggest winners were the robber barons, 
the very companies that were cheerleading Dr. Fauci's lockdown and censoring his critics. Big technology, big data, big telecom, big finance, big media behemoths, Michael Bloomberg, Rupert Murdoch, Viacom and Disney, and Silicon Valley Internet titans like Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Eric Schmidt, Sergey Brin, Larry Page, Larry Ellison, and Jack Dorsey. The very Internet companies that snookered us all with promise of democratizing communications made it impermissible for Americans to criticize their government or question. Thank you. Madam Clerk, any additional online speakers? Yes. Serge, your microphone is now available. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Serge Cagno, Executive Director of the Recovery Cafe Santa Cruz and member of the Mental Health Advisory Board representing District 4 for Supervisor Hernandez. My thanks to Director Morris and Dr. Ratner and the many staff and partners who work tirelessly to support some of our most vulnerable members of our community. As I know some of you know, recovery cafes support those both housed and unhoused, build community, and work on their healing goals of mental health, substance use, domestic violence, homelessness, post-incarceration, and social isolation. Our program relates to multiple strategic focus areas in our Healthy Santa Cruz framework, but particularly to number three, increase connections, and number two, prevent homelessness. My thanks to your support and those of you who have given of your time to learn more about our program. Thanks to Chair Friend and your visit to our Santa Cruz program. Thanks to Supervisor Koenig, Supervisor Cummings for your visits to the San Jose's program. And thanks to the county staff, Dr. Ratner, Karen Kern, the Behavioral Health Adult Services Director, and Shelley Barker, Healing the Streets Program Manager, for your visits to the Recovery Cafe San Jose as well. We also hosted Representative Panetta and a representative from Assembly Member Gail Pellerin's office. Uh, we uh, invite and hope to offer future tours for you, Supervisor Hernandez and Supervisor McPherson. The 37, the 57 recovery cafes across the country and in Canada provide a safe and supportive space for those who are how, unhoused and connect with services with a warm handoff, proven method of engaging people who are resistant to being a part of the system. The recovery cafe has provided services. Santa Cruz has provided services since 2021. We create a meal together. We eat a meal. We have peer support services. People gain certification and gain more responsibilities. Santa Cruz lacks day uh, services, options for day services for those experiencing homelessness, both housed and unhoused. And we ask for your help in acquiring varied and grants and contracts to enrich people's lives and lessen the impacts on our many other county services. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. Thank you for your work. Are there any other Kaylin? speakers? Please. Yes, we do. Kaylin, your microphone is now available. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So um, I've heard so much today about um, making sure that housing is affordable and uh, potentially putting new housing units available, which I think is clearly so vital. Um, I'm I'm wondering what are the efforts on the other side of the drivers to homelessness, including uh, mental health as well as drug addiction, and what are the services available? Do we have the capacity for those that are in need, which is my understanding that we don't? And what emphasis are we putting on that side of the equation when it seems like it's pretty important to limit the repeat cycle of homelessness and um, you know the other factors that come into play as far as safety for the community? I won't take my full two minutes. That's just all I had to say. Thank you. Call in user ending in 0249. Your microphone is now available. Hello, uh, my name is Carol Paul Hamas. Thank you so much for taking my call. I would first like to say thank you for the informative report. I really appreciate it and all the hard work that you've been doing on this issue. I have just one quick comment to make. Um, I'm on the board of a group called West Side Neighbors, which is a 3,000 member, mostly Lower West Side Santa Cruz organization. The Lower West Side has been greatly impacted by people who are living in their vehicles. An average count is about 65 vehicles a night on city streets in the Lower West Side. 
We've been advocating for several years for more safe spaces parking on county parking lots. And I wanna um, highlight and underline what the other two speakers said with regard to that. I think uh, increased RV parking, increased vehicle parking with services would allow relatively easy access for people to enter into the county system to help you know, receive even more services and put them on a path to housing. Although I think that um, building more housing is absolutely key and I support that effort. I think the immediate need is for services for people who are already living in their cars where they do feel some degree of safety. Some people would rather live in vehicles than at the shelter. So thank you for whatever you can do to increase those safe spaces parking. We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you, Madam Clerk, and thank you for everybody that participated in this. We'll bring it back to the board for action. Is there a motion? Uh, I'll second. I, I just had one question before we, we vote. Um, so in terms of some of the immediate needs of private shelter uh, providers, I understand that um, at some point in the near future, we might be considering the creation of a housing for health vendor pool, and that that but through that process, we may be able to make some additional funds available at least until you know we consider a new budget this June, May, May and June. Is, is that accurate? And uh, at what point will we consider that vendor pool? Um, Oh, my auditor colleague left. Um, so yeah, vendor pools are not the only means to the end goal. It is a means and a couple of communities have adopted them. We're working with GSD purchasing and our auditor colleagues on some um, important details before we bring it to the board to support that. That what that would do is um, organizations that are in the vendor pool with the auditor and purchasing approval, we can more expeditiously bring to your board a contract with some available funds to sort of hold some of these organizations together. Um, we are endeavoring to get that back to you within a month, um, but I can't speak for kind of how the process will play out. Even if that doesn't happen, we will come back to your board. We hear and recognize the sort of um, challenge. And I guess I just want to um, underline how I started. Um, there is not enough money and every single thing, every public comment made is all important. So we will bring forward everything. And we think as staff, we just wanna say, and if we choose this, <laughs> it's to the neglect of that. Or if it's direction of this, and we don't have new funding, we have to take away that. So we just as staff wanna make sure that complexity is very clear. But I think what your point is, we are actively working on trying to how to support um, current capacity. And just, I guess, stay tuned. We're working very hard as staff on, on the process. I don't know if you want to add any details. Okay, thank you. Look forward to seeing that in the next month or so. Thank you. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Koenig if we could have, for the recommended actions, if we could have a roll call, please. Absolutely, Chair. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Fred? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ratner and Mr. Morris. We'll move back to uh, the agenda items that we needed to skip for the 1045 scheduled items. So our next item is item nine, which is a public hearing to consider a resolution authorizing the issuance of Santa Cruz County Capital Financing Authority Lease Revenue Bonds 2023 Series A, and then not to exceed amount of $18 million and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the board memo the uh, resolution sublease series and notice of sale series and indenture of trust series and assignment of agreement series. Here to present for us today, I believe we have our budget manager, Mr. Pimentel, as well as um, Susanna, I imagine you're there too. I can't I can't see you right now, but I imagine that uh, we've got Ms. Harrell and, and Mr. Carey, if I am correct on this, and I appreciate Ms. Harrell that you're waiting uh, for this item to be heard and welcome back, Mr. Pimentel. Uh, thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, before you, we're going to actually do a presentation on both items 9 and 10 while they're separate items. The first one is uh, us asking the County Board of Supervisors to act as the County Board of Supervisors to open a public hearing, close a public hearing, hearing and, and adopt the resolution authorizing issuance of bonds. Item 10 will be our Santa Cruz County Capital Financing Authority. You'll be acting as the Santa Cruz Capital Finance the Authority Board of Directors, and that's where we'll be asking for the adoption of the resolution to issue the bond. So it's a two-step process. We're going to do 
both cover both items with one presentation and then you'll be taking the items separately. So with us today are myself, our, your county budget manager, but leading the presentation will be Suzanne Harold. She's our financial advisor at Harold and Associates. Uh, she's been uh, guiding the county for a long time and expertly so. She does a really nice job making sure we get the best financing package at the best deal at the best time. So we really appreciate that she's here today and to present. We also have Travis Carey, our director of, of capital projects, who will be here from Public Works for any questions about the project. That ends my point and I'll turn it over to Suzanne. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. Um, we're here today to talk about the financing of the improvements to the South County Government Center at 500 Westridge in Watsonville. I don't know if the presentation is up on the screen. Everybody can see it. Great. Uh, thanks. So um, in 2021, the county acquired the uh, office building at 500 Westridge with the intention of creating a, a South County Government Center. The total cost after the completion of the design and the construction bids is estimated to be about $27.9 million. You do have $11.2 million. Uh, remaining from the 2021 bonds that was uh, raised for uh, the purpose of doing the improvements. Um, the 2023 bonds that you're going to be considering later uh, later this morning or this afternoon um, would raise about 16 million and there's about 700,000 of investment earnings and, and other funds um, to, to provide the total funding requirement of $27.9 million. So the issuance of lease revenue bonds is the county's traditional method of financing infrastructure. You've used this many times um, over the last 30 years. It does require a public hearing uh, by the Board of Supervisors as the legislative body where the, um, where the improvements are being located. And then following uh, the public hearing uh, for your consideration will be approval of a county resolution and then acting as the Board of Directors of the Financing Authority, a Financing Authority resolution. The 2023 lease revenue bonds uh, are expected to mature in um, 2051, which is consistent with the maturity date of the 2021 bonds. So the whole financing of the project will be paid off at the same time. Um, the annual debt service is, is likely to be approximately $1.2 million and it'll start in 20, budget year 25-26. Uh, the bonds will be sold at a competitive sale scheduled for March 9th. And the expected interest rate is going to be somewhere between four and a quarter and four and a half percent, depending on market conditions, um, and which can change obviously before the bonds are sold on March 9th. Uh, the resolution before you does approve and not to exceed five percent, uh, mm -hmm. but we do expect it to be something less than four and a half percent. The approvals that are included in the resolutions before you today are to authorize the sale of the bonds and they set the parameters for the bond sale, like we were saying, five, you know, not to exceed a 5%, not to exceed $18 million in principal amount. Uh, they appoint your uh, financing team, they approve the distribution of the financing documents to investors, um, and they also approve the form of various documents required for the financing. Um, and they're listed on your screen. There's a sublease, a sub sublease, an indenture of trust, assignment agreement, and an official notice of sale, as well as the uh, preliminary official statement, which describes the county and its um, and its finances. So the recommended action is for the county board of supervisors to open the public hearing and take testimony. Close the public hearing and. It, after such time, you can consider adopting the resolution authorizing the issuance of the bonds by the financing authority. And then uh, the companion item is for the uh, uh, financing authority board of directors to consider their resolution authorizing the issuance of the bonds. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Harold. Are there any questions from board members before we open up the public hearing? I'll, I'll just like to make a quick comment about uh, as we've said it before, but this investment in the South County Service Center is really the, one of the greatest investments that our county has made in, in equity in South County and transportation equity even for employees that work in South County and service providing in Watsonville and the broader South County. This is just such an important uh, and integral investment 
And I appreciate the leadership of our county staff and helping bring it to reality. I'd like to now open up the public hearing. Mr. Chair, I'd just like to repeat some of your comments, but in, in particular, I'd like to uh, thank, uh, it's an opportunity to thank our CAO, Carlos Plas, who's the former city manager of Watsonville, who's, without whose leadership, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, it took a lot of people to do it, but it took a leader to get him there. And he was the one that was really the core of what made this happen. And uh, it's another, um, really example of how we're expanding and developing more services for the sec and accessibility to the South County. Um, it, it, in addition to expanding that presence in South County and the, uh, the new government center will shorten the commutes for some and help us on our highway one uh, bottleneck that we have, uh, which is in everyone's best interest, I think. And uh, it comes um, as a CAO and health service played a pivotal role in keeping Watsonville hospital open um, as well as supervisor friends leadership in uh, addressing the Pajo River project. Uh, huge projects uh, all addressed at the South County. And I'm really glad that we are able to have a, a number of success stories uh, just in the recent, uh, this year, really, uh, that has all come together. So thank you uh, for everyone who's uh, been really directly involved in all of that. And there's been many, many people involved, but uh, this is great that we're gonna be able to address some real needs in the South County. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'd now like to open up the public hearing. Are there any members of the community that would like to address us on this item during the public hearing? Currently, there are no attendees in chambers, and I do not see any speakers online, Chair. Thank you. Well, then I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action on item nine. I'd like to move item nine and open up the hearing for the revenue bonds. I wrote it all over my paper. Yeah. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez, are you just are you moving item nine's recommended actions, which includes yes. the public here? Okay, so uh, we have a motion from Supervisor Hernandez to move the recommended actions on item nine. Is there a second? Second. We have a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call vote, please. Absolutely, Chair Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Friend? Aye. And we'll move to item 10. We had already received the initial overview, but this is as the Board of Directors, excuse me, as the Board of the Santa Cruz County Capital Financing Authority to consider adoption of a resolution authorizing the issuance, sale, and delivery of a not to exceed $18 million aggregate principal amount of lease revenue bonds 2023 Series A and approving related documents and official actions as outlined in the memo of the CIO. As outlined before, we have the agenda board memo as well as the uh, preliminary official statement series of 2023A, the sublease series, the notice of sales series, the notice of intention to sell bonds, the indenture of trust series, the assignment of agreement series, and the authority resolution series. We've already received a presentation on this. Uh, this is simply an adoption of a resolution, does not require a public hearing, but I will open it up for public comment. Are there any members of the community that would like to address this on the resolution? Uh, that are in chambers right now. Again, Chair, we don't have any members of the public uh, wishing to speak in chambers, nor do we have any speakers online. Thank you. So I'll close public comment. And we'll bring it back to the board for action on item 10. This is our motion. And so moved items A through H as well. Second. All right. So we have a motion from Supervisor Hernandez for the recommended actions on item 10. We have a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Of course. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Chair Friend? Aye. Thank you. That passes unanimously. Thank you for uh, Mr. Pimentel, Mr. Carey, Ms. Harrell for your presentations. We'll move on to item 11, which is the last item on today's agenda. Um, just like to note, uh, confirming with council, there is no closed session today, correct? Correct. No closed session today. All right. So this is the last item on today's agenda, which is item 11, which is to consider a report by the County Administrative Office and Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience on Operational Area Alert and Warning Best Practices, Public Information and Social Media Communications, and approve a recommended technology platform for further consideration and direct the 
Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience to return on or before March 28th, 2023, with a contract as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the agenda board item as well as the attachment. And here to present, we have uh, Lisa Benson, our assistant CAO, Dave Reed, who's the director of our OR3, and Sam with 40, our cannabis licensing manager, Ms. Benson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good, uh, I guess good afternoon, everyone. A quick introduction. We're excited to be before you today with a report back and recommended path forward to rapidly improve our public safety emergency alert and notification system. Um, we received this direction four weeks ago and took the opportunity to apply our Primo 90-day sprint model to this work. As a quick reminder, um, core principles of Lean and Primo, as we call it here in Santa Cruz, is to involve the people on the ground who, who operate the systems and processes that you're trying to fix, focus on customer experience and, and the value to a customer as you craft new solutions, and really work to measure your improvement as you do stuff um, in an incremental and continuous fashion. So with that, I, I want to also say Tremendous thank you to our public safety partners who jumped into this conversation with us very quickly in the last four weeks. And with that, I'm going to pass it to uh, Dave and Sam to talk about uh, what we what the problem is and how we worked with our partners to come up with a solution to present to you today. Good afternoon, board. Um, so on behalf of OR3, um, look forward to having a, a brief conversation given our afternoon time. Um, we wanted to just briefly discuss the problem as articulated by the board and as we identified briefly and quickly review storm impacts and then go into the Primo process description, make the recommended, recommended technology platform, discuss how we want to look at a holistic improvement to our emergency communications and then to touch briefly on best practices. So as, as identified um, by the board, the OR3 and prior to OR3's existence, the Office of Emergency Services has not had the independent uh, capabilities for alert and warning at our county. That is a, that is a defined gap in our skill set that we want to identify and address um, through this process. As your board identified on the 31st, as well as in communications during the event, we had community members receiving multiple evacuation orders over the over the weeks of the event. Community members were directed to various different shelters, maybe not always the, the most uh, appropriate one for where they were being noticed. Um, evacuation areas were too large um, relative to our zone haven zone definitions. Um, our alert and warning system, Code Red, doesn't currently integrate with social media, so we had a multi-step process to get information out through the various channels. Um, we obviously, as I believe Supervisor Hernandez articulated on the 31st, want to reduce our barriers to subscription to get more folks engaged in alert and warning. And then obviously there's real-time situational awareness from our public and being able to differentiate between information and intelligence in the event in, in emergencies is a critical piece, but we want to be able to capture and use that information from the public as effectively as we can. The other thing that we identified at the staff level was, was to make sure that we have an updated current emergency communications playbook or a, a plan on how to implement our communications tools effectively to meet the needs of our community. We don't currently have that document in our quiver of tools. The other thing that we recognize is that as a small county, we need to integrate with Netcom, um, not compete with them. And then obviously to be effective in communications during a disaster, we need to have the right PIO um, resources available to us and implement the technical solution as well as the techniques outlined. So. In the interest of time, I want to be very brief through the next series of slides. But as we all know, we experienced nine atmospheric rivers. And in those first few weeks, one um, hit the entire coast of California in 2022. So really unprecedented. Um, of those nine, four of those events caused major damage in our community, a series of emergency declarate proclamations on the 3rd and 6th, but also a series of evacuation orders warnings and orders, and then um, lifting those evacuation orders through those series of events definitely created that yo-yo of communication and impact for the community. This is a complex slide, but I'll just very briefly articulate that the black line represents the river levels in the San Lorenzo River, and the blue and orange boxes represent rainfall totals at two different rain gauges. And what we saw as the storms went on is that the rivers were responding more dramatically to less and less rain, which made 
figuring out and understanding based on forecasts and expectations what the river was going to do complicated, which obviously complicates communications when what we're seeing is unprecedented responses to what would normally be uh, relatively mild rain events. So as I said, the four atmospheric river events that we hit experienced caused a, a series of evacuation orders being issued and lifted over those the fourth, sixth, and eighth atmospheric rivers. And obviously that communication that we were making through the various channels um, without some of the tools that we're going to talk about today um, led to some confusion and complications and emergency communications that we want to improve upon moving forward. So with that, I want to hand over to well, actually I'm going to a couple more real quick um, slides here. Wanted to just highlight that Code Red as our primary current alert and warning platform, we saw a subscribership increase over the disaster. So that middle yellow highlighted figure shows over 4,000 residences, um, over 5,000 new phone numbers were added to our Code Red database through the process. Um, we obviously used all of the normal tools as well to try and communicate out to folks. But again, I think there's a lot of room for improvement that we want to work on. Um, one immediate improvement that we've already started to implement with our social media posts is something from Facebook called Facebook Alerts. And as a local jurisdiction, we're able to elevate the importance of all of our Facebook posts during disasters from a local alert level, um, whether it's a weather, transit, public safety, um, or other issue, we can elevate our social media posts to bring that, to raise the level of attention of that post in people's feeds. So that's one tool that we've already started to use in this most recent weekend um, of, of extreme cold weather with some of the alerts that we've posted on social media. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Sam to talk about our process. So we chose to view this as a Primo project due to the time sensitive nature of this challenge. Um, our first step was to determine a path forward and we knew we needed more voices in the room. So we formed a working group with the Sheriff's Office, Cal Fire, Central Fire and Netcom. Uh, we th then defined the process we'd follow, which included analyzing the root cause of the issue um, and our current process. Then we'd review all potential technology solutions and finally review product demonstrations before making a, a choice to present to you here. Um, down. Um, so as we began the root cause analysis and review of the current system, we discussed the problem that we that needed to be solved. As we completed um, this step, we began refining the goals to what you see here. The technology solution had to be able to serve Netcom and meet our needs while meeting the board's objectives of integrating social media, decreasing the barrier to entry, and retaining the current enrollment database. The working group identified this as the priority. Netcom's critical life safety dispatch function has to utilize the same system as the county. We need to ensure that our emergency communications complement Netcom's mission and not distract from it. You know, the working group recommends the use of the GEM system or Genesis technology system for the following reasons. It fulfills all of Netcom's dispatch needs. It integrates with Zone Haven and integrates with Facebook and Twitter in a way that allows us to push out messages via multiple Facebook and Twitter accounts while simultaneously issuing text message alerts, voice messages, county website updates, and email notifications. Uh, the GEM system utilizes our GIS through a live link. This allows us to make adjustments and new layers on the fly utilizing our GIS team and EOC staff. So think of evacuation zones in Zone Haven that can be refined in moments by our staff to provide more accurate and applicable messaging um, as situations evolve. It allows county staff to provide that critical messaging to our community in emergencies while allowing Netcom to focus on their critical um, core function of emergency dispatch. The platform allows Netcom, OR3, Sheriff's Office, CDI, and the fire agencies all to have access to the system with each user having defined capabilities and viewing privileges, which ultimately leads to better situational awareness in emergencies. Now, this system will will follow the guiding principle the working group sought when they refined the board's goals. 
Dave? Yeah, so what I wanted to just wrap on with our presentation today was to discuss kind of three pillars of this effort. One, obviously, as I said earlier, is that we need to have a good, sound emergency communications playbook. But on top of that, we need the right staffing. So our public information officer, the Joint Information Center, and EOC leadership need to be coordinated and working well in a disaster to, to make sure that we're pushing out the right information effectively. And then obviously, as we're discussing today, it's a suite of tools. It's not one tool that will be able to communicate with everybody, but utilizing a suite of tools, we want to be able to give the best information to our community um, so that they can make the best decisions based on, on the conditions that we're experiencing. And with that, I just want to end on some of those best practices that we hope to um, strive towards more effectively in future disasters. Obviously, we want to be first in communicating with the community around disasters. We want to give them information as early and as timely and as accurate as we can. We want to be accurate with that information. So that's really where we discern information versus intelligence. So actionable intelligence is something that's verified during a disaster versus speculative or information from an unverified source. So we want to be accurate in how we communicate. Obviously, we want to be honest and truthful. We want to express empathy for the trauma that folks are experiencing during a disaster. We want to give clear direction on what should be done. Get out of your house now or, or just an, a warning or an advisory. And then obviously, we want to respect everybody throughout our communications. So I think we appreciate, as, um, as Elisa Benson articulated at the beginning, we appreciate the opportunity to explore this deficiency in our, in our communications and look forward to returning to you based on the board direction um, with further movement towards uh, enacting this new tool and this new capability within OR3 in the county. And with that, we'll stop and answer questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Reed, and thank you, Mr. Laforte and Ms. Benson for the presentation. Uh, this was an item that I brought forward, and I do have some comments and questions in a minute, but let me open it up to my colleagues first. Or any of my colleagues have any questions or comments regarding this item? Uh, Supervisor Cummings. Thanks for, uh, thanks for that presentation. Um, and the service seems like it's going to be a, a real improvement to the current services we have, uh, which is great. Um, one question I had is, I'm just wondering, is this an opt-in type of communication system, or is there a way that the county can add residents um, and then they can opt out? And so I'm just kind of curious, because it sounds like we had a lot of people who signed up for Code Red during these past disaster events. And so just you know, making sure that people are going to be signed up who signed up previously, just wondering how that can be handled and how we can get more people signed up. Yeah, we're we're definitely going to be doing everything and expect to be able to preserve our initial code red subscribership. We're not going to lose those. Every indication with conversations with partners and providers in the in this industry, we're confident that we can retain those. And we are exploring other databases of information that may be able to be built be added in. Um, and then obviously it is generally speaking an opt-in um for additional members as they come online. So once we implement this, we'll be doing some notifications and education opportunities and having folks who haven't registered try and get them to opt in. But by opting in, we can also add additional information. So some of the Code Red folks that have signed up early on may not have language preferences. So we wanna make sure to get people mm -hmm. to give us the most accurate information so that we can push out in their, in their native language and with this new system, they'll be able to get the, the tailored alert specific to their language of preference. So we want to refine and improve our data as well. And then the second question I had was, I'm just wondering in terms of coordination with the cities, kind of if you can speak to maybe what's being done so that, you know, county residents are getting, you know, calls from or notifications from this service, but are the cities using the same service so that we're all kind of on the same platform versus having competing platforms across the county? Yeah, I mean, Zone Haven is our best example of how that works. So the county, countywide adopted Zone Haven and became integrated into the cities. And what we hope by choosing a product that integrates really effectively with Zone Haven and something that the county is partnering with Netcom on and that Netcom is using, that there's an opportunity that the cities recognize that maybe we all move to the same platform. So certainly this platform would support 
um, city communications at whatever level they want, whether they be informational or emergency based. And our hope is that we all move towards that same similar platform so that we're all in one technology solution. Great. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Supervisor Koenig asked both my questions. I'm glad we're thinking the same things. Um, I would definitely be in support of an opt out process if, if we do identify a database um, that you know, we could add a lot of people to. I mean, we get so much random spam and messages of all kinds uh, as everyday people today. I think, you know, uh, this would qualify as highly relevant, you know, where uh, where to evacuate to or or how um, your county is dealing with a, a at hand emergency. So, um, you know, and there's always texting stop if you really don't want to hear it. Um, I want to commend this team for the improved communications over this past weekend. You know, I think one of the silver linings of <clears throat> constantly being in a um, state of emergency or, or dealing with just these traumatic weather events is that it does provide the opportunity for uh, rapid iteration and improvement. So I noticed a big difference this past weekend uh, compared to the January storms and, and, and praise as well deserved here. So um, also, I'm really glad that you're looking at this in terms of more holistically, excuse me, in terms of procedures, staffing, as well as the tools. I think we could have easily missed the mark here and just, excuse me, thought that, hey, if we just upgrade the tool, that'll fix all our problems. Um, question, do you recognize that that's not the case? I'm glad. Um, and I think the handbook will be um, really a welcome addition to this entire update. Um, yeah, no questions since uh, Supervisor Cummings asked them, but good work. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Any other? Uh, Supervisor yeah. McPherson. Yeah, just I do want to um, repeat. Thank you for the prompt response. Yeah, government can really respond quickly, and you've done a great job of doing this. It's going to be a tremendous uh, improvement to have these effective tools and uh uh, to respond to these disasters, and uh, we've had enough of them, but I, I do remember some time before, the months before the CZU fire, my office worked with uh, CAL FIRE to establish Zone Haven to see how we can uh, bring communications, emergency communications to the, uh, this is a tremendous step above and beyond that. And uh, the result was, uh, it was really amazing in that fire that uh, how many people were evacuated and there's no were no loss of life and no no accidents at all. It was phenomenal. And this is gonna be, make it this much better. Um, the, the big problem that I still have with my district in San Juan's Valley is that um, during disasters, tele, telecommunications breaks down and I just, um, and they often do that. Uh, how do we plan to address this plan? I mean, it's just try to expand further or give more options to open. I, mean, I think you've done, you've reached out very well. So I'm just, uh, I know, I just know for a fact that uh, communications break down in disasters up in Santa Rosa Valley. And uh, do you think that there's more steps that need to be taken still in that regard? Certainly, um, the CAO's office in OR3 is working with ISD on the next gen radio upgrade project. So that's going to be a significant tool that helps us from our um, first responder dispatching and communication standpoint. But one thing even over this past weekend that we recognize is the co-location of equipment is important and where we can expand our capacity um, as an example, Boulder Creek Fire had some communication constraints, but what we're trying to do is co-locate some of that cellular technology on some of our critical infrastructure. And we certainly do need to expand the locations of cell towers in the county to improve communication and make sure that they have redundant power as well. I would just add, Dave, can you talk a little bit about the emergency weather radio program that you had introduced already? Because I think this addresses a lower tech solution to that gap of people basically can't, there's no power to their phone yeah so as a reminder and and for for supervisor cummings and hernandez we do have the ability both with our existing tool and with this new tool to be able to push out non-weather emergency messages um so that's through the NOAA weather radio system and the nice thing about those is that they're generally battery can be battery powered um, and so folks can have those as a supplemental piece of communication and receive messages from us. So it's a it's a tool for those instances where where the valley or different parts of your districts may be without power for a prolonged period of time where those devices 
may may not have the the battery life for those. And so we'll be using that, as I said, as one of our tools in a disaster where we've seen kind of that prolonged power outage. Supervisor Hernandez. I don't have any questions, just kudos to you guys to bring this um, to the board today. Uh, you know, I think it's really going to help people uh, in times of emergencies to have access to this information and uh, allowing them to be prepared for these uh, situations uh, if they have a suite of uh, information, not just one form of information, whether it's, you know, television, radio, uh, infographics on social media, and of course, the text alerts. Um, in phone alerts, right? Reverse, uh, reverse phone. But you know, we need all that in times of emergencies because you know sometimes uh, people are out and about and they don't have their phone. They don't have their phone or they don't have their laptop. So we need all forms of uh, media. Um, you know, I think that uh, we can help out. You know, put out this once it's up and running. You know. I, my suggestion is that we uh, put it on social media once it's up and running so we can promote the new system. Uh, maybe we can put it out in our constituent newsletters as well. If there's a QR code for it too. You know, we can promote a QR code for it as well. That's it. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Um, I'll just make a, some brief comments before we open it up for the community. Again, appreciation that uh, there was action taken on the item that I brought forward and the board supported. Uh, what did precipitate it was were challenges around uh, communications in both of our previous major disasters, meaning CZU and this. Uh, however, as the board previous board letter stated and the board had adopted, we were looking for something that was broader than just on the emergency basis. I recognize that the the letter that came forward to us today says that it focuses on sort of a phase one and lack of better terms on the emergency outline and then on the information side. But I don't think that uh, uh, the latter should be deprioritized. I think that that generally speaking, I think from a 30,000 foot view, the county needs to prioritize communications period. And it shouldn't be an ancillary function. We, we have a, an outstanding PIO. When we get into an emergency situation, we, um, you know, the, the EOC structure does rely on those that aren't traditionally in a communications field to now take over that role. And there's actually, it relies on a lot of people with a lot of um, secondary roles to take over emergency uh, communications or emergency response. So I think that that the county in general needs to look at um, having in a, a, an additional person that has an expertise in, in modern communications to help supplement our current um, outstanding PIO, whether that's in the social media realm or whatever it may be. But I think that that uh, I, I can I, I can already sense, especially once we start uh, creating tool books and playbooks, that this will be an underutilized or high bar to access tool. And that is not my goal. And I don't think that's the point of the board. I think the point is that we would like to over communicate with our constituents, both on an information side and an emergency side, and let people make a determination of of what information is relevant to them. And, and to Supervisor Cummings' point about integration, the reality is, is that a city resident can sign up for the county alerts all the same. There's It's agnostic to location. Uh, there are many county residents that sign up for, say, Santa Cruz Police uh, outreach now. And I think that that's a good, a good point that we have that component. But I think that, that the county does a lot of things that it'd be nice to be able to communicate with the community about or, or even uh, non-storm related, there are special events that may block traffic or whatever it may be that that we should be able to communicate about. So I would like to encourage uh, the working group. Um, I recognize the goal was May in, uh, for fire season, but I, I would like to see that we are willing and comfortable with implementing a tool well before then without necessarily a vetted playbook by a number of people, because I think that it's going to uh, be an evolving process of usage that we're going to try it out and get feedback and the playbook may need to uh, evolve. I'm just concerned that there needs to be something very prescriptive in place and I just don't want to prevent communication as a result of that. I also don't need to only prioritize emergency <laughs> communications. This should be a broader tool. So that is uh, sort of just my general feedback on on the item that it isn't too it's not, not a critique even of what came forward because I think that what, what's being proposed today is a significant step forward in communications for the county uh, in general. I just want to provide additional guidance that it not be limited to or exclusively focused on. And as a result, we're not skewing our evaluation of the various tools just to emergencies when we need it to be a broader tool. 
don't know if Ms. Bezison, you had any uh, thoughts on those comments. Uh, no, I think that's that's a a doable a doable um, add to our objectives for the ninety day sprint. And and there's an aspect where, just off the top of my head, implementing testing the tool with lower risk communications, non emergency communications, is in some ways an easier. You don't need to go through all of the role definition and responsibilities. So that's something we can look at um, in terms of our migration strategy. If and we I, can re if, report back. If I could uh, make a point, uh, Chair Friend. The, um, one of the things the board did in last year's budget was to add uh, three public information office, officer positions in three different county departments. So we have one um, PIO in the CAO's office, that's Jason Hoppin, but we added three new positions and one of them is in uh, what is now CDI, Community Development and Infrastructure. Another position is in the Health Services Agency and another position is the Human Services Department. Those uh, three positions are in the process of getting filled. Uh, they will uh, be housed in those different departments and their primary function will be in those departments, but they will also report partly to uh, Mr. Hoppin and a matrix management uh, supervision um, style so that there will be uh, the ability to use those, those other three PIOs to do the exact thing that you're talking about, getting other information that we would like. And also in the event of an emergency, they will be in the uh, EOC. So we'll have three new positions to supplement our current uh, PIO person. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. Yeah, uh, as you remember, I was very supportive of that. I mean, it's taken a long time to get that. I mean, those positions aren't filled yet. And so that I was just trying to uh, emphasize the need to, to have broader communications. I think that those three roles will be very important. It'll take a time for them to get trained up. But I, how about this? As we, as we take an eye toward the hiring of those roles, we should look for people that have skills in modern communications in a way that communicates uh, looking forward with all these new platforms as one of our criteria, not a, um, uh, you know, the PIO of the past, which was me, for example, at Santa Cruz Police. I mean, my skill set is not the skill set of what modern communications, I think, would require. Um, and so I just want to make sure that as we go through that hiring process as well, that we we look to that eye to the future. Um, we'll open it up for the community. Are there any members of the community that would like to address this on this item? We do have one speaker walking up to the podium right now, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, hello. My name is James Newman. Anybody can look online to page 493 of this session's um, finder. So emergency communic on page 493, emergency communication principles and guidelines. Follow these basic principles and guidelines from crisis emergency risk communication published by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention can help establish a sense of order and consistency. These principles are applicable to any incident, disaster, or emergency. So you guys, I'm kind of repeating some information. I'm going to say be first. Crises are time sensitive. Communicating information quickly is critical for members of the public. The first source of information often becomes the preferred source. I'd like to say that over some recent research, I've found three areas where, for whatever reason, information that I've shared and other people have shared in these publicly recorded sessions has been censored. But to go in more specifically to what people spoke about, you know, there's a there's a, there's a physician that in 1996 wrote a book after being a physician for 25 years called Medical Mafia. She describes Western medicine as petrochemical finance, sickness over health, profits over cures. She did some lists about, she asked her patients questions. One of the questions was, what percentage of you trust your uh, politicians? 6%. If she asked, what percentage of you trust your doctors? 76%. Well, you politicians are controlled by lobbyists, and the lobbyists control... Um, you politicians are controlled by lobbyists, and you guys are influencing the, the doctors, and I think there's a lot of misinformation. So I made a kind of a list of things. It would just be, once again, I'm only here because I actually care. And when something really happens, what are you guys going to do? Thank you. 
Is there anybody no online? Madam Clerk, there's nobody online. Correct. We have no further speakers, Chair. Great. We'll bring it back to the board for action on this item then. Is there a motion for? I'll move the recommended actions. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor McPherson. Uh, Supervisor Cummings. I just had um, one last comment to make before we uh, voted on this item, which was, um, you know, I was really focused on the uh, kind of the zone haven and the shift to this new platform. But just given the conversation around communications broadly, I think that um, one thing to take into consideration is really whether there's an opportunity for the county to partner with some of our local radio stations that under the event of an emergency, that radio station could be one of the primary outlets where they operate their function is to just get that information out. And, you know, there's an opportunity for us to, you know, if, if it, if there's a contract with them, maybe we can have FEMA funding help re reimburse us for the to cover those costs of getting that communications out. But you know, to some points that have been brought up by Supervisor McPherson and also Supervisor Friend, um, you know, when people have, have lost power for multiple days, we're encouraging residents to have some kind of FMAM radio that they could use. We know that this has been historically used to get information out. There's coverage throughout the entire county. And so it's a really good low tech way of being able to make sure that people are staying informed. Um, obviously, they can't, you know, communicate back to us, but it's at least an opportunity for them to get information that's uh, low cost, um, low tech and really effective at getting communications out. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Uh, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Absolutely. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. And that concludes this item. And it also concludes today's Aye. agenda. Our next uh, regular meeting is on March 14th at 9 a.m. Thank you, everybody.